Hello, I'm uh, Eric Toder from the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center, and I'd like to welcome you to our fourth joint conference on taxation with the University of North Carolina Kennan Flagler School on high profile business tax issues. I wanna thank our colleagues at UNC, Courtney Knoll, Jeff Hoops, and Ed Maydu, who have worked with TPC in organizing the programs for these conferences. I would also like to thank my colleague Thornton Matheson for her contribution to developing the program and Ann Clevin, Ivy Hunter, Aaron Coons, and others on the urban events team who arranged the technical details for this conference. Uh, Jared Bernstein of the Council of Economic Advisors will lead off today as our keynote speaker. We will follow with panel discussions of proposals to impose a minimum tax on the book income of corporations and of the effect on investment of the Biden administration's corporate tax proposals. Um, before we begin, a few housekeeping details. The event is being recorded and the recording will be posted online. Speaker biographies are available online. All participants are muted. You can type questions or comments into the QA box at Q and A box at any time, and be sure to include your name and organization. You can hide captions or adjust settings with a live transcript button. And finally, you can post comments to Twitter at hashtag live at urban. Now, I am uh, pleased to introduce uh, Jared Bernstein as our keynote speaker. Jared is a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. And before joining the administration, he was a senior fellow at the Center of Budget and Policy Priorities. Before that, he served as chief economist and economic advisors to Vice President Biden during the um, Obama administration. His uh, full impressive bio is in the conference materials. So Jared, thank you for joining us and we look forward to your comments. Well, thank you, uh, Eric, and to the Tax Policy Center and uh, of course to the UNC Tax Center for the opportunity to speak to you today. I started to count the number of papers and testimonies wherein I uh, depended on TPC tables and analyses, but I quickly concluded it would be easier to count the few papers that didn't cite the center. <clears throat> Over the next few minutes, I'm gonna talk about two broad areas. First, I'll share my brief take on uh, the Biden economic team's current theory of the macroeconomic case. And second, I'll speak uh, about what motivates the president's tax proposals and how our proposals, how our proposals spawn, uh, respond to those motivations. As someone who's been around for a number of business cycle shocks and fiscal and monetary responses to those shocks, I can tell you that the response to the current crisis has been uniquely strong. Given the importance of their independence, I no longer flap my gums about Fed policy the way I used to do when I was in the private sector, but their statements and speeches have consistently stressed strong and ongoing support throughout the crisis and the nascent recovery. But fiscal policy, which I can talk about, has been uniquely strong, both relative to our own history and to the actions of other countries. President Biden came into office uniquely battle-tested, having played a critical role in the fiscal response to the Great Recession, especially as the implementer in chief of the Recovery Act when I was his chief economist. His instinct in this case was to hit back hard and to be guided by a risk management framework wherein the risks of doing too little were given significant weight against the risks of doing too much. From the outset, the president's guidance was that the health crisis was inseparable from the economic crisis. And even as we speak today with all the progress we've made in terms of the labor market and GDP recoveries, Fighting the virus and distributing the vaccine remain at the heart of our goal of launching and sustaining an inclusive, robust recovery. One dynamic of the current moment that we view as particularly important is the non-linearity of the path forward. As our CEA chair, Cecilia Rouse likes to tell us, you don't go from being in a coma to running a marathon in a few months or even a few quarters. In other words, markets do not adjust instantaneously and the fact, uh, and that fact is showing up in the current economic environment as constraints on the economy's supply side. We see this in certain product markets, including lumber, used cars, and semiconductors, and to a less clear extent in the labor market as well. As an aside, allow me a quick observation that might resonate with some of my fellow progressive economists. 
For many of us, our economic thinking has long been shaped by the fact of persistent shortfalls in demand and in the rejection based on strong evidence of the assumption that full employment is the normal condition of the labor market. We have, I think it's fair to say, thought less about supply constraints in terms of analysis and policy tools. As such, this is both a challenging and extremely interesting moment. So is the current labor market supply constrained? A more precise way to ask the question, one that's more germane to the moment, is what barriers exist between labor supply and labor demand at this moment. One is surely the virus itself, which thanks to the rescue plan is very much on the run. But vaccination rates while climbing quickly are still a constraint for working age persons as less than half of those are vaccinated. And then there's childcare. In-person schooling as summer arrives, camps are not fully back up to speed uh, and access to affordable childcare is another constraint, one which our administration is making a bold and potentially consequential run at both in the near term through the rescue plan and in the longer term through the jobs and families plan. Of course, enhanced unemployment insurance benefits have been raised as a factor here too, but that debate has generated more heat than light. President Biden has stressed that there are many who still need this help and we've seen little data-driven evidence that places with higher replacement rates are seeing worse labor market outcomes. But the president has also stressed that those who are offered suitable safe jobs must take them or lose benefits and that as Americans get vaccinated in greater numbers and the economy recovers, enhanced benefits will end on schedule in early September. And there is one more very traditional factor in play here, which I think of as Keynes meets Hayek. Strong demand induced in part by powerful fiscal and monetary stimulus is generating price signals, including the labor price, the wage, that is signaling supply to respond. Conditional on anchored inflationary expectations these all seem like important and salutary developments. In other words, when it comes to the macro output, I sleep like a baby. That is, I wake up screaming every two hours. But more seriously, we're closely monitoring these developments from both macro and micro perspective as we work through this unprecedented period. So let's turn to tax policy. I told Eric that much like the economic outlook, I'd give the president's theory of the case without getting into too many weeds. Now, I know that this audience craves weeds, and for that, I refer you to the new Green Book, uh, which is not only extremely well done in terms of clarity of exposition, I will freely admit at this point that I'm enamored of our tax team, uh, but it has the revenue table as a spreadsheet. So you're welcome to DC's interns and RAs. It might be useful to start with some motivating observations, the ones that loom large for many in our administration. One, we must relink pre-tax growth and revenues. Updating a simple model I've used before, I find that economic conditions would have predicted that the US Treasury would have collected 19% of revenues as a share of GDP in 2019. The actual amount collected was 19, uh, was 16% of GDP. Using today's GDP, those three percentage points amount to over $600 billion. Relatedly, corporate tax revenues as a share of the economy have fallen to 1% of GDP compared to 3% for OECD countries. The effective tax rate on US profits of US multinationals recently clocked in at below 8%. The fingerprints of the 2017 tax cuts have been found at the scene of this delinking crime. Two, we must reverse incentives to offshore investment in jobs. As one of our treasury analysts uh, observes, quote, by blending income streams from high and low tax countries and taking advantage of the current exclusion in the US minimum tax, US multinational companies can be taxed at a 50% discount or more relative to their domestic peers. Three, we must rebalance the taxation of wealth versus work. As more wealth has accumulated at the top of the scale, non-labor income has been treated increasingly favorably. This is the source of the president's argument that our reforms are, our, our reforms are intended to tax wealth, not work, and his line in the sand enforcing no tax increase of family incomes below 400,000. Four, we must recognize defunding the IRS as a shadow tax cut for those who evade paying their fair share. This tax gap is another dimension of inequality and it stems disproportionately from non-labor income, which is of course concentrated at the top of the scale. Five, we must incentivize clean energy production. So how do these motivations, and this is but a partial set, map onto our tax proposals? 
As regards relinking, correcting the dealing, so relinking revenues and growth, our recently released budget, which of course includes these proposals, shows revenues growing from 16.3% of GDP this year to 19.9% at the end of the 10 year forecast when we have the jobless rate close to its pre pandemic level. Uh, as I'm sure this audience knows, uh, this president proposes to replace half of the 2017 cut in the corporate tax rate, taking that rate from 21 to 28%. Our proposed changes in international, international taxation are worth a full presentation by themselves, uh, one that should be delivered by our Treasury OTA team, not me. Uh, but I presume like me, you spent your Sunday morning this week reading about the historical progress to a global minimum corporate tax of 15%. Yes, there's a lot more work to do here, but we're off to a stronger start than many envisioned. When the 2017 international tax, tax changes were introduced, analysts quickly realized that because guilty tax liabilities were calculated on a global versus a country by country basis, taxes paid in high tax jurisdictions would generate credits that uh, allowed untaxed profits to be shifted to tax havens. Also by boosting foreign tangible assets, multinationals could exempt more foreign profits. Such incentives are antithetical to President Biden's agenda to shift investment productions and jobs back to our shores, and we reverse them in our proposals. Next, in a move that I hope would be welcomed by a TPC UNC audience, we propose to reverse the disinvestment in IRS enforcement accounts. Obviously, we're motivated by the tax gap, the many billions difference between taxes owed and taxes paid, and by recent work by top tax economists on ways to close it. Our proposals in this space are guided by the fact that the misreporting percentage is 5% for income subject to substantial information reporting, but greater than half for various categories of far less transparent business income. To address this costly and unfair problem, we propose new information reporting on the inflows and outflows of financial accounts. Experts in tax administration express confidence that this change will significantly increase the visibility of underreported business income. And once the word is out that sub, such information is flowing to the IRS, encourage increased voluntary compliance. Next, to follow the president's strong admonition to prioritize the production of clean energy, we propose to repeal 13 different credits, deductions, and other special provisions that favor fossil fuel, fossil fuel extraction and production to extend and enhance credits for renewable and alternative energy sources, including solar, geothermal, fuel cell power plants, wind power, and more. I suspect folks here recall my famous 2010 articles, and I admit there was more than one of them, touting the 48C Clean Energy Manufacturing Tax Credit. Well, this 30% credit was highly affected, uh, effective back then, but oversubscribed given its low cap. Our new proposal boosts the cap, and qualifying projects now include energy storage and components, electric, electric grid modernization equipment, carbon oxide sequestration, and energy conservation technologies. There's way too much to discuss. And again, interested parties will enjoy pour, pouring through the Treasury's new Green Book. But I did want to highlight two more changes, both of which I'm particularly excited about, and one uh, of which I suspect you haven't heard much. Starting with the one uh, you're probably familiar with, President Biden has proposed and even already legislated in the rescue plan a transformational increase in the child tax credit both enhancing the credit and making it fully refundable. As a former staffer at the Senate uh, on Budget and Policy of Priorities, I can tell you that these changes projected to reduce child poverty by half are as welcomed as they are overdue. It has long been an aspiration of anti-child poverty advocates to deliver the kids credit on a monthly basis. Well, in a particularly exciting development with, a strong, uh, with strong real world implications, Last week, the Treasury announced that the first monthly payment of the expanded and newly advanceable CTC will be made about a month from now. In mid-July, roughly 39 million households covering 88% of kids in the United States are slated to begin receiving monthly payments. I need to tell this audience that such an accomplishment is not a finger snap, but it is a great tangible example of something President Biden considers to be extremely support important. We don't sign a bill and then forget about it and move on to the next thing. The president insists that we always think about implementation and delivering the best results to those who depend on those results, 
And that's governance uh, Biden style. Finally, one of my personal goals these days is to spread the word about the Biden administration's housing proposals. We've been talking a lot lately about supply constraints and affordable housing is of course high on that list. Housing experts, Mark Zandi and Jim Parrott recently wrote, in fact, it's out today in an op-ed, president's housing plans represent, quote, the most significant housing policy effort in a generation and entirely appropriate given the scale and importance of the problem. They also argue that the magnitude of the plan has the potential to produce or preserve some 2 million affordable homes, just about the number needed to address the shortfall. On the tax side, these plans include expanding the low-income housing tax credit, approving contributor to affordable rental housing for low-income tenants. Next, to correct for the fact that there are really no federal tax provisions directly supporting building or renovating owner-occupied housing, we propose a new tax credit, the Neighborhood Homes Investment Credit. This credit supports new construction for sale and rehabilitation for sale and for existing homeowners. Finally, to encourage the investment of more patient capital in low-income communities, including commercial real estate, we propose permanency for the new market tax credit, another credit with a solid track record. I'll close by reflecting on two permanent moment, moments that had great saliency for me in recent days, moments that I hope put a useful framing around my comments to you this morning. First, when I go jogging in my neighborhood, which I do very slowly, as you might imagine, I often run by this baseball field that's been empty all spring. I didn't realize how sad this empty field made me feel until a couple of nights ago when I ran by it and it was filled with little kids playing t-ball. While I don't have an aggregate rate for this indicator, it symbolized a central goal of the president's agenda to speed the recovery out of the crisis, to get shots in arms and checks in pockets so that those kids can get outside on a clear spring night and smack the baseball. Second, last Friday morning, I stood on the North Lawn of the White House getting ready to go on TV and discuss the addition of 559,000 jobs in May, the decline in the jobless rate, and the fact that since President Biden took office, employment is up over 2 million, a record for a new administration. As I waited to go on, I flashed back to going in front of the, uh, some of those same cameras back in 2009, when in the grips of the Great Recession, payrolls were down by 2 million. Uh, now, you can guess which appearances were more pleasant from my perspective, but the moment posed a stark reminder of the critical importance of economic policy to the lives of the American people, especially those less insulated and thus most hurt by economic shocks. It is a great privilege to be part of that policy process, and I look forward to input from those in the policy community, many of whom are here today, as we continue to put this crisis behind us get ready to build back better into a more resilient, robust, and inclusive recovery. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Jared. And um, I appreciate your willingness to stay around for some questions. Um, I don't have any questions from the audience yet, so I'll start with a few of mine, which Will reflect my parochial interests, and then maybe uh, others will will chime in. So let me start with um, a, a question about one of what I thought was one of the most significant recent developments, which is the agreement uh, by the G7 for a global corporate minimum tax. I was wondering if you had any comment on that and how you would try to persuade the U.S. Congress to go along with this if, in fact, the G7 agreement does materialize. Yeah, that's a, a, a good question. And, and you know, I share your uh, sentiments about this. I mean, we've been working on this for a long time. I'm actually uh, part of the deputies group that has been uh, talking about this for ever since, since, since before we got here. And I think that uh, there are many, as I said in my comments just now, who were surprised uh, by this outcome uh, so far, um, pleasantly so. Uh, because it's extremely consistent with the motivations that I just talked about in my comments. And it's an example of um, uh, different countries holding hands in a way that was uh, notably absent in the, in the uh, tax policy and uh, all the other policies of, of the past administration. Uh, so uh, it's, it's interesting, by the way, we should be talking about this when uh, the president is on his way to the G7 uh, to continue to normalize relations. 
So very positive, you know, uh, and, and as you also suggested, uh, there, there's a steep road ahead. Um, as far as Congress is concerned, you know, I tend, uh, I have the privilege of not wading into political uh, 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 debates like that because I stay in my economics lane. Um, I will say that there are members on both sides of the aisle who view uh, this uh, problem of, uh, of uh, uh, transfer pricing and uh, the kinds of revenue dynamics I talked about in my uh, in my in my comments as as problematic, uh, but have often raised um, well we don't want to jump without other countries. So uh, maybe for some of those members, uh, this kind of uh, collective action uh, will be uh, more welcome than you might expect. Okay, thank you. We have a few other questions now. This is from uh, William Rice of Americans for Tax Fairness, and he wants to know if President Biden is determined to stick to the twenty eight percent corporate rate. And comments that reducing the 25 would lose roughly 300 billion in revenue. That's his, his estimate. Yeah, the president has been clear on uh, uh, a number of kind of red lines and probably the most important one in this context is uh, no tax increases below 400,000. Um, <clears> the, uh, this question came up during some of the negotiations around the infrastructure plan uh, when there was uh, some introduction of a, uh, a minimum book tax, and uh, we talked about the global minimum. Um, and uh, uh, the president was uh, very consistent in saying that uh, the plan that's put forth in the jobs and the families plan, I guess this would be from the jobs plan, uh, the, uh, what, what, uh, what is uh, described in the Treasury that made in America tax plan uh, is full speed ahead. And so he is committed to, uh, uh, to the, uh, the plan as, uh, as articulated. Uh, on the Treasury website and the Green Book. Okay, thank you. I have another question. We have, they're coming in fast and furious now. This is from uh, David Wessel at Brookings. He asked, David asked, with the benefit of hindsight, was the fiscal stimulus too large? How significant is the risk of overheating and more inflation than welcome? Well, as I said in my comments, um, I think uh, the, the risk of doing too little loomed very, very large for us, still does. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I'm never gonna argue that some, uh, uh, any measure with a T next to it was perfectly calibrated to the dollar. Uh, but um, I, I'm, I, I'm very, uh, you know, excited about the extent to which, let me speak, I know David thinks about the macro economy. Uh, I am very excited by the extent to which uh, these fiscal measures are pulling forward the path back to full employment. Uh, I know David has seen uh, the Fed's own forecast, and you can see um, uh, that of, uh, I, I just saw a, an interesting graph from uh, Mark Zandi, uh, which I can share with, <clears throat> with you, Eric, if uh, the group wants to, to look at it, uh, which shows how much more quickly uh, we're expected to get back to uh, uh, pre-crisis labor market conditions. Now, that was a 50-year low in labor market, uh, uh, in unemployment and labor market tightness. And I did not think going into this crisis that we would get back there as soon as these forecasts are saying, now maybe the forecasts are incorrect, uh, but um, I think we have, uh, I, I think the president uh, is, is, is you, you hear the president going out now talking about the important benefits of getting back quickly to full employment. Uh, I mean, he's literally using those words, which is you know very much music to, to my ears because much of my career has been spent writing about the benefits therein. Um, as I said in my comments, uh, yes, you do have a situation where strong demand is, uh, is meeting a supply that is, uh, uh, has some bottlenecks and some clear constraints. We said from the very beginning, we thought that these, uh, these measures would generate heat, but heat is not equal to overheating. And what you really have to look at in that regard is the extent to which uh, these pressures on the price side are transitory. Uh, you should look at uh, trimmed versus uh, uh, measures uh, that uh, inflation measures that include uh, the outliers. And uh, you should pay very close attention to, um, to uh, uh, longer term expectations. And like most forecasters in the Federal Reserve, we, we still believe that those, those pressures are transitory. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, something we're monitoring extremely closely, something we care a ton about uh, it's also the purview of the Federal Reserve in terms of managing it, uh, so I don't want to lean too far over those skis. Uh, 
Uh, but I think that from a risk management sense, uh, things are in uh, unfolding, as I said, in a favorable way, conditional on uh, uh, continued, anchored, uh, continued anchoring of expectations. Okay, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. This is from uh, Garrett Watson, who I think is at the Tax Foundation. Um, what tax changes do you see being the most important in priority in the discussions of the present uh, revenue proposals? Wow, <laughs> you're, you're really asking me to choose between my children, and you know, I just I just can't do it. Um, uh, I mean, you could look. Look, I, I'm I'm. I'm a bit of a revenue guy, right? So, so you know, my the part of my speech where I talked about just now my comments where I talked about the delinking between economic growth and revenue flow to the treasury. I mean, that just hit me like, uh, you know, a punch in the face. I, I, I just, I just really, really hate that. And uh, and so, you know, the whole package again, go through that spreadsheet uh, from the Green Book, and you'll see you'll see the many components of the package. Um, I, I think. The, uh, I guess I, I, here's how I'll answer the question. Uh, two answers, I, and this is going to take. I'll try to be glit quick, Eric, but it's a hard. You know, it's a. I could talk for an hour about this. Um, I'll try to. Be, so I really like the parts that um, kind of kick back against um, uh, the, the increase in wealth concentration. Well, with the four hundred thousand line in the sand, it sort of all does that. Uh, so the fact that the the, the reforms. Um, help push back on uh, pre-tax uh, concentration, I think is very important. Uh, I like the extent to which they um, uh, speak to some of the wealth issues. So um, the stepped up basis reform is, is one that's you know, uh, dear to my heart. Um, and uh, so is the corporate tax, because that's uh, not just a tax on capital income, but these days, as Kim Clausing will tell you, it's largely a tax on excess profitability, which by the way, has important implications for uh, both uh, distributional outcomes and investment uh, outcomes, uh, uh, even in a kind of a classical public finance sense. Um, I know there's a panel on that later. Um, the other thing that's really one of my, fa my favorite part, though, is the compliance part. I, I just can't say enough about that. And uh, that's in, in no small part because everybody should be for that. You know, if you're not for compliance with the code, um, then you have to stand up and explain to me why uh, that's you know why that kind of uh, uh, evasion is is okay with you. So I think that should be something that is robustly embraced uh, by everyone in this debate, uh, regardless of what political stripes you're wearing. Okay, I have time for maybe one more question, but this is probably too hard for you to answer quickly. Maybe you can. Uh, there's a couple of questions about the global minimum tax. One from Eric Oren of uh, Grinnell College, who um, asks about the um, whether the G7 uh, could ag agree on a unified tax base definition, and a similar one from Carl Russo of Price Warehouse Coopers, who was asking about um, the fact that there's no carve out for real activity in the president's uh, global minimum tax, and he's uh, comparing that to the OECD. Uh, proposal that does have a carve out uh, for tangible assets. So the question is, how will the administration ensure that American companies are? I think both have to do with the the tax base. So if you yeah, I, I'm not going to get into uh, that level of of weeds, especially given that um, many of those negotiations are still going to have to take place. I will just um, uh, re up something that uh, our Treasury Secretary uh, talked about uh, when it came to. Um, competing uh, based on uh, transfer pricing and profit shifting versus competing on uh, investing in your workforce and, and, and productivity enhancing uh, use of, of resources. Um, and I think if you look at the totality of what we're trying to do here and look back at some of the motivations I articulated in my comments, um, uh, you'll see that we've, we've, we, we've tried to uh, really balance uh, the competitiveness of uh, American international companies and uh, the need for fairness and uh, 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 revenues in, in, a, in a climate where uh, far too much uh, income uh, was escaping uh, taxation in a way that was inconsistent with the president's equity uh, goals. And so I think that, you know, that balance is always going to raise weedy questions like the good ones that were just raised. 
uh, and we have to find a way to answer them that maintains the balance. Uh, I think that uh, I can tell you that that is a high value of our tax team. This is not a tax team. This is a very deep and well-educated tax team. All of my, almost all of my favorite uh, tax experts, uh, every time we go on these videos or on these meetings. Uh, so uh, so um, uh, I can tell you that it, this is not a, uh, this is not a, a, a set of um, folks who are, who, this is a set of folks who are acutely aware of the competitiveness fairness trade-off. And I think we're, we're striking the right balance. Thank you. I can certainly agree with your characterization of your outstanding tax team. And um, uh, this, I'd like to keep you for longer, but uh, we're running out of time. We're out of time. So thank you very much for joining us for your interesting comments and Q&A responses. And I'll now turn the program over to Jeff Hoops, who will moderate the next session. Jeff is an associate professor at the Kennan Flagler School, University of North Carolina, and it serves as research director of the UNC Tax Center. Thank you, Eric. So in this panel, we're going to talk about President Biden's proposed minimum tax on financial accounting income, also known as book income. We have on the panel Dhammaka Dharmapala from the University of Chicago Law School, Michelle Hamlin from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Sloan School of Management, and Natasha Sarin from the U.S. Department of the Treasury. I am Jeff Hoops from the North Carolina University of North Carolina's Keenan Flagler Business School. And we're just gonna jump right into to the panel taxing, uh, taxing book income. So just to set the groundwork for what the policy proposal actually is, Natasha, could you explain the basics of how the Biden administration's proposed tax on book income would work? Yeah, of course. Uh, and thanks so much, Jeff. And thanks to all of you uh, for having me today and for being part of this discussion. I'm just really thrilled to be here. Um, the sort of basic fact that is important to bear in mind as we think through the minimum book tax proposal is an understanding of how taxes work in this country for corporations to date. So taxpayers are generally required to compute their taxable income based on their books and records. Various provisions of the tax code result in providing profitable companies with a variety of allowances that let them reduce their income that ends up being subject to federal income tax. And simultaneously, we see those same corporations reporting huge profits to their shareholders. And as a result, those executives of those companies get huge boons uh, to their own compensation that's related to that huge profitability. Uh, but they can simultaneously, and part of that profitability accrues from being able to claim that their taxable income is at such a low level that they don't have any federal income tax liability. And in a typical year, the way the proposal is designed is it kicks in um, and imposes a minimum tax on book income for uh, companies with pre-tax net income of $2 billion or more. So it's a relatively small subset of companies. We're talking about about 120. Uh, but in a typical year, a significant share of these 120 are paying zero or negative uh, federal income tax in any one year. So what the administration's proposal is really targeted at are these subset of hugely profitable corporations that just in today's economy are not paying their fair share. That's a theme, and Jared stressed it as well, that's a theme not just of the minimum book tax proposal, but more broadly of our tax agenda here in the administration. The way that the proposal is designed specifically to kind of answer your question, Jeff, now that I've given a bit of level setting, is that it imposes a 15% minimum tax on worldwide book income for these corporations with uh, income in excess of $2 billion. So in particular, what taxpayers are going to do is calculate what is called a book tentative minimum income tax that's equal to this 15% of their pre-tax book income, subtracting uh, net operating loss deductions from book income, also subtracting, subtracting general business credits, things like R&D, clean energy and housing credits, foreign tax credits, uh, and what the book income uh, that is the book income tax liability that is gonna end up being faced by any of these 
corporations is going to be the excess of whatever the tentative minimum tax is relative to the regular tax that these taxpayers are paying. Uh, taxpayers are also going to be allowed to claim a book tax credit generated by a positive book tax liability against regular tax in future years. So we've really thought through the contours of this proposal sort of quite uh, clearly. It's laid out very explicitly in the Green Book as well. Um, but the overall objective and the overall desire and kind of motivating principle here is to make sure that just like ordinary taxpayers uh, who pay the taxes that they owe uh, in any particular year, the same should be true for large corporations and there should be a way to kind of at least backstop against some of the tax gaming that we know is happening today. Hopefully will happen much less as all of the Biden administration's proposals become law. Um, but this is an important backstop and an important component of the agenda. But it sounds like from what you're saying, you're, you're, the motivation seems to be that corporations aren't paying their fair share, that they're, they're gaming the system. Uh, so is, I mean, is, is, are these low tax payments the result of something nefarious these companies are doing? Or what is, I mean, why aren't these companies paying more in tax? So I think it's important to sort of emphasize and just understand that there is a lot of uncertainty with respect to what is driving the very low tax liabilities that we're seeing for many of the largest corporations. I think what it, I mean, you are well familiar with this sort of empirical research as well, um, Jeff, but we know that the sort of book, the wedge between book and tax income widened very significantly in the late 1990s. There is empirical research that tries to understand what drove this uh, increase and it, ha it coincides with a rise in opportunities for tax sheltering kind of activities that exist um, more so today than they did historically and are again, just to emphasize the interaction between all of the administration's proposals are very much a focus of the broader tax agenda as well. Uh, it's also the case that there are, and you know this well, there are a set of loopholes and avoidance schemes that are embedded in the tax code. And when you have sophisticated corporate taxpayers and the bevy of tax advisors that they have at their disposal, there are opportunities to exploit those as well. It's also the case and sort of, and just to emphasize the the way the proposal is designed, it's also the case that there are general business credits that exist in the tax code that incentivize the kind of activity that we want to see in the corporate space of things like R&D tax credits that we wouldn't want to penalize corporations for taking advantage of through any design of a minimum book tax kind of scheme. Uh, and that's exactly why sort of we've made, we've accounted for those in how the structure has been laid out here. So all that is to say that I think your point, there's a great deal of uncertainty as to what drives the book tax difference. Uh, I think that it's very important, though, to have a system in place where there can be some backstop against this increased wedge between these two structures, and there can be capacity to make sure that large corporations aren't gaming the system as aggressively as they appear to be today. So, it, I mean, you, we have this, uh, this is a tax on book income, and we generally haven't uh, taxed book income, at least for a while. Uh, some of our listeners uh, might not kind of understand we have kind of two simultaneously tax, uh, tax system going on. So it might be confusing, again, that we have a, a tax on taxable income, and then we have this separate profit number. Uh, Michelle, could you explain why we have these two different systems and, and why, you know, why for example, we might be seeing a big disparity between them that might be increasing. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jeff, um, for inviting me to be here, and um, I'm happy to answer uh, these questions. So, you know, the two systems that we have, financial accounting system and the tax reporting system, they're intended to accomplish different goals. So the financial accounting, the whole purpose of that is to provide outside stakeholders with information. And what you want to provide outside stakeholders is information about the economic performance of the firm. And so ideally, you know, financial accounting standard setting is free of lobbying 
Um, and the standard setters then can just focus on measuring economic performance of the firm to give outside stakeholders information. And I mean like investors, potential investors, creditors, potential creditors, uh, various parties like that. In contrast, taxable income is computed to raise revenue, obviously, so that the government has funds to you know, um, pay for public finance. The tax rules are often used by governments to incentivize behavior as well or disincentivize certain behavior. So if we want firms to invest more, we give them more deductions on capital um, expenditures. And there's things in the tax code that try to keep companies from doing certain things like um, limits on deduction of what they might call excess uh, executive compensation. So the tax code wields this social behavior kind of incentives and disincentives, whereas financial accounting should be free of all those things because we really just want to measure economic performance. You know, the systems are different and they will come up with a different income number, but it's important to note that a lot of things in the two measures do actually conform already. So things like sales, accounts receivable, accounts payable, things we would call current accruals are, you know, actually to a large extent already conformed. Um, so, you know, in the end, because these two systems have different purposes, I do strongly believe we should keep them separate and we should have two systems. They're intended for different purposes. And, and the main worries, you know, I think from the tax side would be people might say, oh, FASB would get too much control over the tax code. You know, and actually I'm worried about the other side much more than that. I'm worried that the Congress will have too much influence over accounting standard setting. And if that were the case, you know, financial accounting earnings quality will decline and capital markets will have much less information. And that that really is my main worry. And have we ever seen any instances in the past where Congress has kind of exerted undue influence over the Financial Accounting Standards Board and it affected any accounting standards? I mean, is there something, is this like a real concern? Has it happened in the past? Um, I would say yes. I think when we saw what FASB, you know, what, when FASB was deliberating about executive stock options and how those are accounted for, we saw strong influence from Congress, um, members of Congress on how FASB should account for those. And, you know, ideally that's not supposed to happen. Now FASB is supposed to be separate. And then most recently um, we saw in the CARES Act, you know, FASB or Congress stepped in and basically suspended um, CECL and certain, there were two different accounting rules that, FASB, that the Congress suspended that FASB had in place during the pandemic, which, you know, I, again, ideally you shouldn't see that happening. Uh, so that we do have evidence that that does happen even in a case where there are currently very separate systems and ideally that shouldn't happen. Okay, and I, I'm going to be, uh, thank you, Michelle, I'm going to be taking questions from the audience kind of as, as this goes. So send your questions to that Q&A box. And I have two questions uh, that are actually very similar. Uh, Mindy Hertzfeld and Jefferson Vanderwalk uh, both have a question for Natasha. And I'll read Mindy's question. It says, it sounds like the proposal that, Min, that Natasha just describes in response to the fact that corporate taxpayers claim deductions enacted by Congress. Wouldn't it be preferable for Congress to repeal those deductions rather than substitute a different tax base just for some companies? So I think uh, that some of the sort of pushback against the, a proposal like this one exactly has the flavor of Mindy's question, which is, you know, why isn't it just the first best option to get rid of loopholes and avoidance schemes that are embedded in the tax code and being exploited by these corporations rather than having this backstop through a minimum tax structure. And Dan Shaviro has this great piece on minimum taxes that I highly recommend. Uh, but in it, he quotes a book called, I think it's called Six Proofs of the Existence of God and how someone was giving a seminar about this book and after, like sort of after the first proof, someone in the audience raised their hand and said like, you know, if the first proof is so good, why do you need five other proofs? <laughs> and all that is to kind of say that I think the point here to emphasize is that taxing corporations is hard. That's a point Jared already made in his remarks earlier today. And a lot of income that should be taxed ends up escaping taxation. So it strikes me as totally reasonable and in fact desirable 
to have complementary components of a more broadly defined tax system. There is a separate piece of this that I'll just mention. I'm no expert on it at all, though. I'm an academic who's very lucky to be having this opportunity to serve. Uh, but what, I'm, what I think the case to be made and has been made by some in the literature and some sort of public commentators as well for an approach like this one is a little bit about political economy and political dynamics, which is something you'll hear from tax advocates as they sort of speak to this particular proposal is that it may just be easier to get a backstop in place like a minimum book tax rather than having to deal sort of loophole by loophole with the various aspects of the tax code that are being exploited, which are fundamentally dynamic, right? So it's kind of a game of whack-a-mole as you're trying to think through the various aspects of the tax regime. I, I, I wanna sort of stress that this is one component of a broad agenda that is focused on making sure that corporations and wealthy individuals pay their fair share, just like every American does, sort of not having a tax code that rewards wealth over work. And I think that this is a valuable addition to that broad agenda, precisely because it provides the kind of backstop that is going to ensure that some of these avoidance schemes that are being exploited today are much more difficult to exploit as aggressively in the future. Thank you. So, Dominic, a, a question about minimum taxes since, since we're on that topic. So, President Biden's tax on book income is part of a minimum tax system, like Natasha just, just uh, told us. When Senator Elizabeth Warren was running for president, she proposed a tax on book income that was not a minimum tax. Could you explain the consequences of structuring this as a minimum tax as opposed to not a minimum tax? Thank you very much. So, uh, so essentially, I think Natasha's point here is that uh, there's, there's a need for a backstop that, um, uh, and conceptually it seems to rest on the view that the tax base, the regular corporate income tax is deficient in various ways that ca cannot be fixed. Um, I think this does sort of raise the question though, if, if, the, if book income is a better measure of a corporation's true economic, economic income, uh, then why not um, use that as the tax base, right? And, and the, the minimum tax doesn't do that. The, the Warren type proposal would. Um, I, I want to turn though to a little bit to discussing the evidence on the sensitivity of book income to taxation, which, uh, about which we don't have a lot of evidence, but, but which I think helps us, um, helps us to, uh, to think through this issue. Um, so from the perspective of evidence-based policymaking, it, we, we are fortunate to some degree in having a prior episode that provides some empirical guidance on whether uh, book income is, is more, uh, more elastic, more responsive to taxes than, than income is defined by tax law, uh, although it happened some decades ago. Uh, this is the, the enactment of the, the corporate alternative minimum tax in the Tax Reform Act of 1986. And um, it might be helpful if, if you don't mind, Jeff, if, uh, to share some slides on this. Um, Ivy, would you mind uh, putting slide number three up? Um, so this will just walk us through how the um, 1986 uh, reform used uh, tax book income over the tax years 1987 to 1989. Um, we had, um, um, if you could just advance to the, the end, thank you. So uh, taxable, uh, the alternative minimum tax income involved a 50% a um, it involved the, adding back 50% of book income um, to a tentative uh, alternative minimum tax income uh, in, in a structure that, that has some close parallels with the one that Natasha just, just described. And it amounted to about a 10% tax rate on book income uh, for firms that were subject to the AMT. Um, so, uh, some, some recent work that I've done um, uh, tries to, to review the evidence that the, for, that um, uh, researchers primarily in accounting uh, uh, gathered from the, from this episode and place it within a wider conceptual framework uh, that, that comes from, from recent work in public finance on the elasticity of taxable income. Um, Ivy, if we could advance to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, just to, to, the, uh, to slide number four, please. Um, 
So um, the elasticity of taxable income we can think of as, uh, as the, the change in taxable income in response to a change in the net of tax, uh, tax amount, the, the one minus the tax rate. And this has uh, attracted a lot of attention in public finance. Um, through, and it's, it's, it's often argued that under certain circumstances, the elasticity of taxable income provides guidance on the efficiency costs of a tax. We can view this as a summary measure of how responsive taxpayers are to taxation and hence how large the efficiency or deadweight costs of taxation might be. Um, for a tax, a tax, taxable income as defined by tax law, um, right, it's just this, what is, what is uh, standard that the regular corporate income tax estimates of this elasticity are around 0 0.2 or less as shown in this table. Um, in the 1990s, a number of um, papers in the accounting literature tried to, to analyze the, the responsiveness of uh, firms book income to the uh, corporate alternative minimum tax and the, the book income adjustment that existed between 1987 and 1989. Um, and um, they, the, those scholars, of course, did not use the concept of elasticity of taxable income, which is something that has developed more recently in, in the public finance literature. But um, what I try to do is to, to impose it by imposing certain assumptions to, is to um, try to try to infer the implied um, elasticity of taxable income. Um, if we could just advance, um, th Ivy, thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, Backing out these magnitudes, it turns out to be turns out that the, the, the responsiveness of firms to the book income adjustment was very much higher than uh, the elasticity of, of corporate taxable income uh, under, under the regular corporate tax, um, around uh, up to, to about 1.7. Um, there's uh, some some more recent work, even more recent work by by Jordan Richmond, a PhD student at Princeton who has revisited the, book, uh, the, the BIA or book income adjustment um, history or an episode using more current econometric methods than were available in the 1990s. And he actually finds um, that, these, that these, these numbers are too low for, for, uh, according to his findings, the, the elasticity of taxable income uh, of, uh, for, for book income is around 3.6. So those, those are very large numbers. Um, and how do we understand them? As a, on the one hand, I think we have this intuition that, um, that many people have that, that book income provides a better picture of the, uh, of the economic position of a firm than does taxable income. Um, on the other hand, a contrasting intuition might be that um, book income might, might actually be more manipulable on the downside. That is um, downward earnings management of, of book income may be relatively unconstrained by financial accounting rules because those rules have historically evolved to constrain uh, exaggeration of, of uh, uh, financial income by firms. Um, and uh, whereas the downward management of tax law based income may be uh, relatively strongly constrained by tax law because after all tax law has developed in order to constrain under reporting of, of income. Uh, so that's an alternative intuition and that suggests um, uh, that that provides kind of a, I think a slightly different perspective on thinking about whether, whether a backstop is needed or whether, uh, whether we might be better off trying to reform um, the corporate uh, income tax base even uh, and, and try, to, try to overcome some of those political constraints that Natasha mentioned. Um, so Ivy, could we stop sharing the slides please? So Jeff, a fairly long-winded answer to, to your question, but I hope it shed some light on. Yeah, thank, thank you. That was very useful. Uh, Michelle, Dominica just told us about this, um, kind of briefly mentioned this experience in the late 1980s where we actually had a tax on book income. Could you tell us any more about that and why, you know, why don't we have that tax anymore? What, what happened in that, that situation? Sure. Uh, so I, I agree with Dominica. I mean, what happened, the evidence suggests is that companies did report lower income during that time period. So companies that were likely subject to that AMT reported lower income, meaning they use the accrual process, like Damico was saying, you know, in financial accounting, we give management kind of a lot of latitude to use their discretion to report. And ideally what you want is them to report their private information about the performance of the firm. And we have a lot of evidence in the literature that on average that does happen, you know, financial accounting, 
income is more associated with stock returns. It's more predictive of future cash flows. So then cash flows and then taxable income. So financial accounting income is a better measure of economic performance by any way we can measure it. But it is also true that um, we do give managers discretion. So if they're under pressure like this, where say the tax payments that they would need to make are based on financial accounting income, then you might see them use this discretion to lower their book income. And that's what we observed during that time period. You know, that um, provision in the 1986 act was set up only to last three years. You know, it was designed that way at the beginning. And I think what they found, you know, was that it was actually very hard to implement. There were a lot of problems, say, with the consolidation rules are very different between financial accounting and between taxable income. The consolidation works differently. You know, it's financial accounting. It's based on level of ownership. You know, if it's under 20, if it's between 20 and 50, if it's over 50, you have different rules at each level of ownership there that's very different than the way we do it for taxable income. So that's just one example. But there's a lot of... Um, complications and trying to implement that. And um, I think that also caused some trouble um, during that time period. But we observed lower earnings quality, you know, firms were managing their earnings downward. And I think administratively, it was kind of more complicated than they expected. So, I mean, speaking of earnings quality, what do you, Michelle, what, what is earnings quality and why should anybody actually care about it? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, Jeff. So, you know, earnings quality, you can think of it basically that um, you want earnings to reflect the economic performance and you want it to reflect the transactions that the company engages in, in a way that will affect decision makers. So what information is most reliable and most relevant to decision makers when they read about these financial accounting earnings? And so that's at a high level what earnings quality is. Um, there's lots of ways to test that and measure it, you know, in the accounting literature, we, we tested that in various ways. And kind of what I was alluding to here, you know, we didn't, you know, this was before my time, but back in the 1986 act, when they did those studies about the EMT, they didn't really test that directly in terms of, you know, what that did to the usefulness of the earnings at that time. But we have a lot of other settings in the accounting literature where, there was an increase in what we call book tax conformity. So in the 86 Act, there was also a provision that required some firms to switch from the cash method of accounting for tax purposes to the accrual method of accounting for tax purposes. And so conformity increased. In other words, book and tax were more closely linked, you know, and so um, you can think of that in a similar way. Financial accounting affected how much tax the company was going to pay. And in that setting, we find a similar result in terms of earnings. Firms deferred more income um, when it was, you know, when they were taxed on that income, they reported lower income. But what we have in that setting are some studies that show also that when that happened, the informativeness of earnings went down. And so it's not the case really that firms are managing earnings upward less. It's that firms are actually giving us less private information that they have to tell us about economic performance. And so I think that's, again, the risk um, of doing these types of um, legislation where they link book and tax is that companies will change their reporting behavior. And then secondly, the, the second risk is, is a risk I mentioned before is that Congress might, you know, put their hands too much into financial accounting standard setting. Thank you. Um, so Natasha, uh, a, a question for you. So we've been talking about the differences between the book system and the tax system, uh, they're, they're two different systems. But another difference we haven't mentioned at all is that book income and, and all of the details in calculating it are publicly disclosed, whereas taxable income is not. We don't, we don't see the tax returns or, or any portion of them for US uh, corporations. So any role in additional mandatory public disclosure in a system that taxes book income? Uh, this is actually a really interesting set of issues and I think relates to one of the questions in the chat about the fact that there is a reconciliation schedule that already exists between book and tax income. It's the M3 uh, that the IRS receives to try and understand what might be driving the, or to help understand, shed light on what is driving the differences between book and tax in ways that lead to the kind of gap that I've described. Uh, I've, I've thought about this in sort of academic life, and I think that uh, this issues of corporate tax transparency and disclosure are ones that the administration's tax team cares deeply about. Uh, all, all I think that we're doing here this morning, or this morning and early afternoon, 
uh, is speaking to a set of policies that are motivated by a general view that it's striking how little US corporations and multinationals in particular tend to pay in taxes. And I think that part of what is useful and kind of allows me to speak a little bit to what Michelle just spoke to as well is like, I think transparency is the route to accountability in very important ways. So you think about the fact that charities tax returns are public uh, and why corporations disclose information about financial conditions to investors. There is no such requirement for taxpayers to make public taxable profits, to make public taxable profits or the ways in which they are avoided. All that's reported right now is total tax liabilities that are paid. And I do think that it's worth seriously contemplating the value of, it's been called like a Rosetta Stone, the M3 that provides this roadmap between book and tax. Uh, I think it's worth contemplating the value of thinking through proposals on those dimensions. They could have different flavors. You could think about the IRS making public this information um, for some subset of corporate taxpayers. You could also think about uh, this being part of a broader set of SEC disclosures um, in the particular corporate space. I think one thing I just want to, since I have the opportunity, like I want to sort of speak to one piece of another piece of what Michelle was saying, which is, I actually think part of the rationale for the minimum book tax proposal, part of the rationale for uh, proposals that might uh, exist to do things like make the M3 public, is that it forces honesty in both directions in important ways. So on the tax side, when they're rep you're reporting taxable income, corporations obviously want to minimize their tax liabilities. That's like the objective is to pay as little in taxes as you can in legal ways, hopefully. Um, on, the, on the book side, when you're thinking about financial statements, corporations have an incentive, and we talked about earnings management already, like they have an incentive to overstate earnings in meaningful ways. And so the difference is that you observe the book tax gap, they can be driven by, I've spent a lot of time talking about tax avoidance this morning. They can certainly be driven by aggressive tax planning, but they can also be driven by aggressive sort of financial statements uh, that overstate true conditions in ways that are, are not accurate and not sort of fully painting a picture from the perspective of investors that's really important. So all that is to say that I actually think that I, under, I, I very deeply understand the concerns about the politicization of book income and the ways in which these are complicated sets of issues. But I think it's important not to lose track of the fact that a real value in having some additional sort of reconciliation and additional requirement that the book tax gap be sort of narrowed in ways that allow us to collect taxes in more meaningful ways from large corporations than we do today is that it will encourage honesty on both dimensions in ways that we aren't seeing presently um, from large corporate actors. Michelle, do you have any, any comments on whether we should use the tax code to help uh, financial statement auditors in the FASB out? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I, in some sense, I agree a lot with what Natasha is saying. I mean, my dissertation was actually on what, what you were just talking about, you know, whether you can use the information in the accounting for income tax to infer earnings quality. And so that was my dissertation. I worked on this for many years, of course. Um, so I, that's exactly right. You could see firms uh, managing earnings up. The difference, I think, in that versus what we would see in this new system is in the new system, everybody would know that now there's this link, you know, between book and tax. And so what managers would do, you would think based on what we know about how they behave is they would say, well, look, I had to report this lower income because I'm getting taxed on that, but here are some pro forma earnings. And this is really what you should look at, you know, and they do that now to some extent actually with gap and non-gap earnings. Um, and so you, you can imagine that world extending to this kind of setting. And that's, that's a fear that we would have. In terms of disclosure, you know, I think we study disclosure a lot in financial accounting and kind of the, the big three things you need to think about is whether it reveals propriety, proprietary information when you increase disclosure, whether the costs are high in terms of compliance and enforcement, 
And then again, the next thing is, um, would it be so complicated that disclosure that it would be hard to understand? Would it be useful, you know, this additional disclosure? And those are kind of the three things we know. We've studied these a lot. Um, in the uh, one place I would think I would refer you to is back in 2003, Brookings and NTJ kind of had this joint conference. And Joel Slimrod, Doug Shackelford, and David Lentner wrote a paper about disclosure of tax returns exactly and why that might be good, why it might be bad, why we don't do it. Lil Mills and George Flesco had the paper in that conference about the M3, and that's where we got the M3. And I had a paper in that conference about, um, you know, what can we infer now from financial statements about taxable income? And I start the paper by saying, you know, not much. And so what I ended up kind of saying at the end of that paper was recommending additional disclosure in a 10K. And what I, what I proposed was kind of a simple extension of what we already do, but add a reconciliation of current tax expense down to cash taxes paid by jurisdiction, meaning current tax expense to cash taxes paid by in the US, that for the foreign and that for state. And I just thought at least that would be kind of a kind of simple extension of what we already know. And we know analysts, we have evidence that analysts and investors have a hard time already understanding the accounting for income tax footnote and data in the financial statement. So disclosing the M3, I think <laughs> we, we can infer safely that that would be very complicated for them to understand. So I think if you just kind of figure out a way to extend what we already have a little bit in the financial accounting setting, you know, obviously we can't tell FASB what to do, but, um, you know, I think that would be a helpful additional disclosure uh, also. So I think there's various ways you could think about doing this. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't be against that, but I think you got to think about the costs, you know, is a proprietary cost going to get disclosed and is it going to be hard to comply with and force? And um, is it going to be useful to anybody to have that extra disclosure? Okay, so a question for any of our panelists. Uh, this is from David Elkins. It says the 1986 reform was for only three years, uh, as Michelle pointed out. This means that corporate management could use its discretion to defer book income beyond that window. Is that experiment relevant for permanent uh, book income tax? Or can we learn anything from something that they knew was of limited duration uh, to a tax that I, I think the Biden administration would like permanent? Anyone have any thoughts on that? So let me just say, so the, the, I didn't discuss the, you know, the various shortcomings of the, the estimates that, uh, that, I, uh, that I described earlier. Uh, and that's, this is certainly true that, that uh, uh, this, this may be a short-term response, not a long-term response. Um, but on the other hand, and, and unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do about it um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, I mentioned evidence-based policymaking earlier, and unfortunately, we're stuck with the with the experiments that, that were carried out in the past. Um, but there are also a number of reasons to think that these might be, um, might be underestimates. For example, the uh, alternative minimum tax was creditable against uh, future regular tax payments, um, which I, I understood Natasha to be saying was, was, was gonna be part of the current proposal too. Um, but but there, there are a number, number of other reasons why um, uh, why we why these might have been underestimates. So we, we don't have a good way to control you know, to do to kind of extend this out over time because it was just short term. Um, but um, uh, but we have other other reasons to think that we, there might be underestimates. Okay. A question from Douglas Shackelford. Uh, he says, arguably book numbers are less important for privately held firms. Is the administration concerned that taxing book income would provide an advantage for privately held firms? I mean, so far we've only been talking about uh, publicly held firms, but the majority of companies out there are privately held. And since this is a question about the administration's concerns, and Natasha, do you wanna comment on that? <laughs> Um, and, and let me just say a moment, I'll take that question, of course, but let me just say a moment in, in, to respond to Domica's piece about uh, the 1986 reform and what lessons we can learn and use this as an opportunity to uh, make a pitch to all of the academics sort of out there listening and in general, those of us who work in this space. I think, and it's not just true about the minimum book tax, I've, I've, I actually have some work on capital gains and understanding the elasticity of capital gains to tax regimes that I think makes this point as well. A lot of the literature that we tend to rely on and tend to have to sort of think through in this space is inherently about 
a set of either tax policies or a set of academic literature that dates back to prior periods in ways that it's not always that straightforward to extrapolate into today's policy discussion. And I think that it's like, it's a little bit, it's both having the understanding of the fundamental uncertainty that undergirds the empirical work that was done at the time that undergirds the empirical work that's being done today and how it applies in a different context. But it's also the appreciation that there is great value, I think, for academics to revisit, and Domica spoke already to some uh, PhD students who are doing exactly this, to revisit some of those, some of that early work and try and with updated methodologies and better data, try and understand what kinds of insights we can draw from the literature. So that's just like a general pitch to, I hope, revise and under, better understand, not just in the space of minimum book tax or the AMP, and in a broader context as well, to try and understand what we can learn from historical experiences and how best to extrapolate that understanding into our policy discussion today. Because one of the things that I've actually been struck by and very positively struck by is, and Jared spoke to it as well, as I have been in this role over the course of the last several months, is the extent to which we really do evidence-based policymaking is a real thing. We deeply rely on the work of academics in this space as thought leaders who are kind of driving towards policy conclusions. And so having the best literature and the best data available on many of these questions is going to impact policy in meaningful ways. So that's just like a little pitch in this dimension um, to answer the specific question about, are you worried about sort of private companies? And are you worried about the nature of the incentives that this sort of structure is gonna create? It actually gives me a chance again to draw a distinction relative to the AMT and to highlight exactly what this proposal is geared towards and the kind of taxpayers we're focused on in this space. So this proposal, and it's distinct from other proposals and other calls for minimum book taxes um, that have been floating around there over the course of the last couple of years, it is about companies that are reporting pre-tax pre -tax net income of $2 billion or more. It is about a very small subset of the corporate universe that is large corporations who are hugely profitable. Uh, and there are about 120 of them, I said, in any particular tax year. So I think in this space, I, in general, I think it's fair to say that there are concerns and there are uh, thoughts as to the ways in which tax policy and policy generally can create incentives for different kinds of corporate structures. I think in this particular space, one of the things that's important to remember is we weigh all of the concerns about designs of minimum book taxes and distortions that some may or may not think that they could create is the real narrowness and targeting of this particular proposal and its role, as I've mentioned several times now as a backstop in our broader uh, tax regime. And I think, by the way, one dimension of the backstop, since I have a chance I can say it briefly, one dimension of the backstop that I think is really important and relevant to sort of news of the day is I think it, this would also provide a backstop for the new international tax regime because you'd have, you would have highly profitable multinationals that would no longer be able to report these huge profits to shareholders while avoiding federal taxation. So I think that's another dimension of, and another interaction of these proposals that I find hugely valuable and important. Thank you. So one, one thing that your response um, kind of makes me think of is, is this proposal is, is targeted at only the very, as you say, only the very largest, most profitable corporations. But the motivation for it was that, that corporations aren't paying their fair share in tax, that they're somehow that they're, they're not paying as much tax as we, as we think they should. I mean, it seems like there's probably a lot of smaller companies that are likewise not paying as much as they should, especially since the size of a corporation to some extent is arbitrary, right? Un unlike an individual, a company can split into two and you have two companies that are exactly half the size. So what, what's kind of the economic rationale between kind of drawing a line in the sand and say only, only firms above the size uh, need, need pay this tax? Well, I think it's important to sort of, and I know I've said this many times now, but I think it's important to understand what exactly the minimum book tax is doing in the context of the president's broader tax agenda. So this, I, you all know this, uh, 
there are $2 trillion over the course of the next decade and changes to the corporate tax regime that have been proposed by this administration, all of which will work towards dealing with the fact that in today's economy, you have a situation where corporations are facing effective tax rates that are well below the effective tax rates paid by their employees uh, in meaningful and important ways. And that includes raising the corporate tax rate. It includes making substantial progress with respect to international taxation that doesn't allow corporations to shift profits uh, or business structures offshore in ways that allow them to lower their tax liabilities. Uh, and it includes really prioritizing equity in the tax code in ways that are deeply important. Uh, Jared also referenced uh, a bunch of much of my work so far in the administration and my work even before has been in the tax compliance space where I actually think there is huge need and value uh, to invest very significantly in the IRS. And I'm thrilled that that's a big part of the president's agenda. Um, and by the way, it's true. I mean, it's, it's interestingly, it's true for corporations as well, the compliance piece, right? Because what you've seen over the course of the last decade, it used to be that every large corporation was audited. Over the course of the last decade, what you've seen is that audit rates have been halved for companies with more than $20 billion in assets. So I think there's space in the compliance landscape as well for significant interventions with respect to corporate taxpayers. But I think all that is to say, Jeff, and kind of a meandering response to your question, which is the role of the minimum book tax is as a backstop and an important backstop that ensures that the largest corporations aren't able to engage in the kind of tax avoidance and tax gaming that allows them to report huge profits to their shareholders, allows us all to see, we see them every year, those news stories that you see about uh, X corporation having you know, negative federal income tax, but, you know, huge profits to shareholders and dividends that are being paid out to the wealthiest of the wealthy. Uh, this proposal is about providing a backstop against that kind of regime for those kinds of corporate taxpayers. But this is one aspect of a broader agenda that is focused on making sure that corporations are paying their fair share of tax liabilities in ways that aren't true today, certainly, and haven't been true for quite some time. So you look at the, it is true that the TCJA decreased the effective tax rate of corporations from like 17% to like 8% but 17% was far below the statutory rate as well. So we know that this is a space and we are consistently, we are now 1% of tax, corporate tax collections as a percent of GDP relative to the OECD average of three. Before TCGA, we were two. So we have always been very low on the dimensions, not always been, but historically uh, in recent history, been very low on the dimensions of corporate tax revenues um, being raised for meaningful ways to fund the kinds of investments in American families and American workers that are essential. And I think the minimum book tax is a part of that agenda, but it's not by far and away the only piece of what we're trying to accomplish here. Okay, thank you. And now a question from Peter Merrill. Um, and I'll, I'll post to anybody, uh, although, I'll post to anybody. It says, how would foreign-based companies be taxed under the book minimum tax? Any, any thoughts on a, we've been thinking, we've just been saying companies, but in the world there are foreign companies and there are US companies. Uh, how would we tax foreign-based companies that operate in the United States, some of which can be large? Anyone, want, anyone dare to weigh in there? Okay. No, no you takers. Don't have any details, right? I mean, the, the details on how this is going to work is like very small. We just, we don't know even simple things like how they're going to deal with consolidation differences. So I don't, you know, I, I don't think we know how they're, and Natasha would maybe know more than any of us how they're planning on doing this, but I think the rest of us, you know, we just don't have the details to know what they're thinking. Okay. Uh, so let's move on. I guess Jordan Richmond asks a question of Domica. So do you think it's necessarily bad from a well perspective if the elasticity of financial statement income is high? Like why, why are we actually concerned about that? that that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, so if we thought this was simply a, a costless, uh, a socially costless um, reallocation of, uh, of, you know, of changing of, of numbers on, on paper, uh, perhaps we shouldn't worry too much about it. Now, in general, uh, 
uh, in public finance, the, the view is that the elasticity of taxable income, even if it, uh, even if it, that it is the result of avoidance activity rather than changes in real economic activity, is um, is, not, is still a, a good summary measure of uh, of the efficiency costs, right? And that's because taxpayers are, are optimizing their, their their different kinds of responses, the avoidance response and the real response, and and equating the, those costs to the margin. Um, it, it depends on how we think about um, what is going on when, when firms manage their earnings downward. Um, the, uh, so one could dismiss the, this uh, by saying, you know, it's, it's simply um, the, what, what's happening is simply um, uh, that, that there are these, um, uh, there, there are gonna be some financial accountants who are, who are devoting their time to managing earnings downward rather than uh, some other more socially productive activity. Um, and perhaps the costs of that are not, not, not so large. Um, but on the other hand, if we're worried about profit shifting by multinational firms, um, usually that, that, is, that doesn't have any real consequences either. Uh, what it involves is, is um, uh, people, is, is, is sort of tax, uh, tax professionals um, engaging in, in, in um, planning activity that um, uh, where, where they, they could potentially be, be engaged in some other uh, productive enterprise. Um, so I think along, so that, that point is a valid one, but I think it would apply with equal force to, um, to profit shifting, right? If, if, we, if we take, uh, take that view uh, to, its, to its logical conclusion, we might say we shouldn't worry too much about profit shifting either. Um, uh, but this is a, this is an, an important question to, to to think about exactly what 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 are the welfare implications of uh, a high elasticity of of uh, book income to taxes? Thank you. Thank you. Now, Todd Castagno has a question. He says, "Accelerated cost recovery is one of the largest big tax differences. Accelerated cost recovery traditionally has very strong bipartisan support." So what, what do we think the odds of Congress being willing to tax book income if doing so would to some extent uh, override the accelerated cost recovery? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, I guess I'll just say it is, it is kind of a strange outcome in the sense that they'll, you know, I said this when I testified in front of Congress too, but it's kind of like they're giving with one hand and taking away with the other. So they. They provide these incentives, but then for some companies, they might yank them back through this um, book tax, you know, this book minimum tax. And it kind of goes back, I think, to the discussion that Jeff and Natasha were having before. You know, if we think that companies are paying too low of tax because of provisions in the code, then it does seem kind of, you know, um, you know, kind of an odd outcome in that sense that they're taking away and giving in this two different hands. But if it's firms being aggressive somehow, then it I, you know, maybe that's the kind of backstop they want to stop. I just, my personal opinion is the costs are too high of doing it this way, but I think it depends on the source, you know, of what you, why you think tax is too low to begin with. I mean, we have I think that I just want to sort of emphasize that this, Michelle is totally right, that it is very complicated to understand exactly what whether it's the existence of a particular provision that is causing exploitation or the kinds of actions that certain corporate taxpayers are taking with respect to certain kinds of provisions that are leading to these very strange uh, outcomes with sort of uh, huge opportunities for tax avoidance and kind of gaming that we're seeing in the economy today. And so I, I understand very much, and like I'm an academic, all of us are, many of us are on this call, like I understand very much that in the sort of first best policy world space, you would think that removing some of these preferences to the extent that we think that they are undesirable is kind of the rational place to start from the perspective of um, trying to address corporate uh, tax underpayment in meaningful ways. I think that some of the political constraints that I spoke to, though I'm no expert in them and nor am I any, have any sort of crystal ball that tells me how Congress is going to actually act and legislate in this space, so I'm hopeful that there's going to be foundational changes with respect to how the tax code operates, uh, particularly for large corporations and for wealthy individuals um, who today are skirting their tax liabilities in important ways. Um, I think that there is there are political economy reasons why an approach like this is desirable. Um, I also want to, I didn't comment on the international piece earlier, mostly because 
this, these are complicated times to comment on international given all that is happening in a very live way. But I will say that part of what the general Biden administration's uh, set of tax proposals contemplate uh, are in fact both an overhaul of how international taxation and taxation of multinationals operates in ways that are going to be hugely impactful, and also provisions that are in place to sort of anti-inversion provisions. I saw one of the questions in the chat, uh, a new push towards anti-inversion provisions that will also be a backstop against the kinds of activity that you might worry would be incentivized by structures like this one. So I think that all that is to say, I hope to put a little bit of uh, flesh on the bones with respect to all the ways in which we're thinking about the various complexities in these proposals and their importance, we think, in creating a fairer tax system. I mean, so I'm, I'm no political economy expert uh, either, but it does seem like just just a comment it does seem like you know congress is very unlikely to say no we're going to take away accelerated depreciation so does this you know taxing book income do is basically hope that the senators and and uh representatives aren't clever enough to understand that taxing book income essentially does that through a back door i i just don't know i mean do we do we know what the chances of this actually gaining congressional support are what, what does anybody have any uh, thoughts on that how, do, how does Congress feel about this? Do we, do we think this could actually become law? Maybe that's uh, not a <laughs> not an appropriate question for this crowd, but uh, okay. Um, and just a, a final question. I mean, on this call, we have people who've been trained in law and economics, some in both law and economics. We have accountants. Uh, tax policy is interesting in that you have lawyers, accountants, and economists all kind of weighing in on, to some extent, the same things. And this is especially interesting, uh, an especially interesting kind of question, because the base is financial accounting related, uh, which accountants kind of kind of know something that economists and lawyers don't. Uh, my impression, and, and maybe you have a different impression, so lawyers, accountants, and economists all have a very different, to some extent, uh, thoughts on this. Do any of you have any thoughts on why that might be? Like, why why is the opinion between these different academic fields different on this on this particular proposal? So I have some thoughts. So then, I'm sorry, Michelle, did you want to? Go ahead, Damika. It's fine. Uh, so um, uh, so there seems to be essentially unanimity among among accounting researchers on on this question, right? That this is that taxing book income is, is not a is not advisable. Um, the the um, papers to the to the contrary that that generally get uh, that sometimes get cited are actually um, they're fairly modest in their claim, right? That, 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 that this might be a good idea in circumstances, and usually people cite Dan Shaviro's work, um, and um, also sometimes um, my work with with me with Desai who's on the on the next panel today. Um, so uh, I actually feel like in in the course of of um, trying to understand the quantitative um, implications of firms' responses to the to the book income adjustment, I've actually um, uh, personally, I mean, I've felt like I've, I've um, uh, been been uh, uh, my priors have shifted somewhat uh, personally. But but um, at the same time, I feel like perhaps in principle it is possible that accounting scholars might. Um, might overly discount some of the benefits of of greater tax collection um, because they're focused on on the integrity of of disclosures from the markets. Um, I actually think that uh, having having uh, now looked into this more carefully, I'm actually a little more convinced that they they might be might be right that uh, in, in placing the weight they do on on uh, that on those disclosure issues. Um, but I think uh, there's there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, fruitful um, uh, interaction that can be uh, that we can have across these disciplines because they bring these uh, these different perspectives to bear. Can I just add one thing? I think I think it's very tempting for people to look and say, "Oh, here's a number that we already have accounting earnings, and let's let's just tax that." You know, it just sounds very simple, and it's very tempting. I think. I, you know, and I think accountants kind of understand the cost, you know, to the capital markets, and we we understand how complicated this actually will be to do this. And I think, you know, I agree with Natasha 100% that we need more research on this, and we should go back and reevaluate the settings that we know about. We should do more in the international settings. I 100% agree with that. I think too, a, a, a kind of problem in the accounting literature is that accountants think it is such a bad idea, and we think it's people already know that it's a bad idea. 
And so it's actually hard to publish these papers sometimes, you know, because um, referees will say, oh, there's no contribution. We already know this is a terrible idea. So, I, you know, there is kind of a publication problem, you know, and incentives to get researchers to take this up. Um, but I think, too, one is that it is tempting and accountants know the cost and we need to kind of try to convey though what we know a little bit better, I think, and maybe come to a compromise or something. And, and I just, I want to just add one piece also to Michelle and Dominica's great points, which is I, in my day job, or not day job, but like in my academic life, I sit at the intersection of law and economics because I'm a law professor, but I'm, a, I was trained as a PhD economist and uh, also do finance research. And so what I'm struck by in like our academic circles is the nature of the siloing of many of these discussions. So there, it's gotten better, I think, over the course of my time in the academy. But in, in many environments, there is economists to themselves about a certain set of questions. Sort of legal scholars might be studying the same set of questions, but will be speaking to themselves primarily. Uh, and accounting scholars will be speaking perhaps to themselves primarily. And there's a lot of value because we look at particular questions in different ways and apply different methodologies to how we study them. I actually think there's huge value in there being more opportunities for sort of cross cross cutting or interdisciplinary conversations on many topics, particularly on tax policy uh, in ways that are already happening and fruitful, but could be improved, I think. And so part of what the part of the complexity is that to Michelle's point, the nature of public the nature of publishing in many academic journals requires that you communicate and speak to and make clear your contribution to the kinds of people who are going to be refereeing your particular journal, which differ if you're talking about sort of writing a law review versus talking about writing an economics paper, an accounting paper, and a peer reviewed journal. But I think part of it is that we have understated amongst ourselves the different kinds of vantage points that different thoughts and different audiences can bring to particular questions in ways that end up being detrimental from the to the literature, but also to the broader policy context, because it'll be like economists think this, accountants think that, and law people think this, and it's a little bit hard to understand cohesively what the literature, what the best literature is or the best evidence is on particular questions. So I'm always think I'm always like gonna use any opportunity I get to advocate both for sort of young scholars in the field to try to take interdisciplinary approaches, but also for those of us who are writing in these spaces to understand the value of having a broader lens of the literature than just the kind of audience to which we normally speak to. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank all of our, our panelists for this uh, fascinating discussion. So up next, we have a panel entitled, what will Biden's corporate tax proposals or how will Biden's corporate tax proposals affect domestic investment? So the panel will be moderated by Thornton Matheson, who is a senior fellow at the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. Thank you very much, Jeff. And um, uh, yes, I'm delighted to introduce um, our panel for the next session. Um, we have uh, Mihir Desai, who is Misuho Financial Group Professor of Finance at Harvard Business School and Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Uh, we have Jane Gravel, a Senior Specialist in Economic Policy in the Government and Finance Division of the Congressional Research Service. Um, and we have Jay Mackey, um, Principal of Ernst & Young and Co-Director of the Quantitative Economics and Statistics Group. Um, so, uh, I, I don't see you all, but I assume, I assume that you have turned your cameras on. Um, hang on a second here. Let me see if I can, I see, still seem to have Jeff, Jeff hoops there. Okay. Um, so, uh, given that the previous panel focused on, um, the proposed, uh, book, uh, minimum tax on book income. Um, this panel is going to focus on the other uh, business tax measures that um, uh, the Biden administration has proposed. I'm sure you're all familiar with them, but just for a thumbnail recap on the domestic uh, corporate tax rate, that's, that's chiefly an increase in the statutory rate from 21% to 28%. Um, not uh, and, and changes to various um, tax credits, particularly pertaining to um, energy and fossil fuels. 
Uh, not too many changes on the base side, although there are several pre-programmed changes in the corporate tax base as part of TCJA. Um, and then uh, despite the title of the session, which is domestic investment, uh, we, we, we consider also um, uh, the foreign minimum tax uh, and the proposed changes there are in a doubling of the rate to 21% um, and um, moving from global pooling to a country by country basis uh, and eliminating the exclusion of a 10% return on qualified business asset investment. Um, so I've asked each panelist to prepare um, a brief uh, about five minutes statement um, on their, their general views on uh, the proposed changes and uh, their potential impact on uh, investment, uh, but also um, uh, profit shifting and revenues. Um, so we will start uh, with Jay Mackey. Thank you, Thornton. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, appreciate being included. So thanks to you and Eric. At the start, I should say that it, any opinions that I might express are my own alone and don't necessarily represent the views of EY or their, or their clients. And so this is just me talking, sharing my, my, my views to some extent. So before we jump into the investment stuff, I thought we, I might say a, a little bit and about whether we really want to raise corporate rates and taxes now because I think it's fair to ask that question. I mean, we just had a major tax change a few years ago. Does it really make sense to jump off that now and make these major changes? I mean, does tax certainty matter? I mean, it is, if we start flip-flopping, we're making frequent major changes in the corporate tax system. Is the uncertainty that that creates going to affect investment? I mean, and right now we're starting with a statutory corporate rate that's just about in the middle of the OECD. And, and we have a minimum tax so that uh, on foreign source income so that to some extent anyway, the income that even if it's shifted into foreign into tax havens is subject to tax. And do, do we really wanna change that when it's just now starting to uh, have an effect? If we raise the tax rate to 28%, the statutory corporate rate, that would put the US right at the top of the pack in terms of statutory tax rates across the developed world. Do we wanna go back there? Even with the 25% rate, we'd be well above the OECD average. It also seems fair to me to ask whether or not, or in what sense corporate tax revenue is too low. I mean, is it really, does it really make sense to compare the corporate tax revenue to GDP or corporate tax revenue to total tax revenue in the US to those same measures in other developed countries? I mean, to what extent do, does European tax policy define what's, what's right for the US? I think that's, uh, that's a fair question. And the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, it, it's also worth noting that according to the OECD and several other tax commentators, increases in the corporate tax are among the least efficient ways to raise revenue. So if we want to raise revenue, do we really want to do it by increasing, increasing the, the corporate taxes when there's other ways? I mean, in, and in particular, do we want to go double down to some extent on a tax system that's been very difficult in the past? because capital income is so mobile and, and corporations generally are so mobile, do we really wanna try and continue on with the tax system that has had huge troubles in the past? And with respect to investment in particular, I think there's a lot of evidence from the past that investment is sensitive to tax changes. The TCJA doesn't really seem to conform to that very closely, but there was a lot of other stuff going on. I mean, tariffs and, Interest rates are very low, and I, I think we may pick up on that later, and Jane will have something to say. Also, with respect to investment, a, a lot of the President Biden's tax proposals are promoted as ways to increase infrastructure and other productivity-enhancing investments. That's probably a really good idea, but you have to ask whether or not the efficiency costs, the distortions, including the reduced investment from jacking up corporate taxes are, are really enough to offset the, uh, the benefits that you might get from, from increased productivity because of infrastructure spending. I think it's fair to question that. I, we did some calculations that question that. I think Penn Wharton budget model has some calculations that question that. 
And then in conclusion, there's the foreign tax changes and guilty in particular. I mean, I, I think it's an open question. I think the extent to which foreign activity is a substitute or a complement for economic activity in the United States is an open question. And I think, I think there's a substantial literature suggesting that the, the foreign activity of US multinationals is complementary to or has no effect on the domestic activity of those same firms. So I think it's fair to question our, uh, a corporate tax increase that's, that's rationalized by a hope to attract uh, additional real economic activity back to the US. Okay. So that does it for my opening remarks. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll move on to Jane then. Hi, and thank you also for inviting me to this uh, to this discussion. Uh, and uh, the thoughts that I'm expressing today are my own thoughts and not those of the Congressional Research Service. So I'm gonna focus on um, the economic effects that we might expect from this tax pass, pass, uh, package. And it's gonna be really based on what we saw in 2017, which is, Jay just said, not much seemed to happen. So we did a paper, a report, uh, my co colleague and I did a report um, looking at the first year after the uh, 2017 tax cut, uh, a tax change, and we didn't find very much. And so what I've done here is try to extend that to 2019. Obviously, 2020 is a, a very different sort of year. So uh, a lot of discussion uh, initially was about how business investment had expanded in 2018. Uh, and it did grow initially, uh, although it fell off in 2019, but it didn't grow in a way that was consistent with the incentives and the corporate tax cut. The, the uh, assets that were, should have had the biggest effects had the smallest uh, uh, growth effects and the ones that actually were negatively affected, which would be R&D, for example, uh, actually had the biggest growth effects. There was also, as one subsequently uh, can learn from looking at the data, more detailed data is that a lot of the growth uh, had to do with oil prices and, and uh, oil, almost all of the structures investment was because of uh, mining uh, shafts, well, oil, well, uh, oil wells. Um, so there wasn't much of an effect on investment. Uh, one of the arguments for a lot of these, uh, for the lower tax rate in the United States was that um, uh, it would encourage capital flow from abroad. And uh, we have to set aside repatriations, which are just paper thing, incomplete paper measures, and look at the real capital inflow and virtually nothing happened. That would be the current account. Virtually nothing happened to the net inflow of capital either in 2018 or in 2019, certainly nothing out of the ordinary, nothing big enough to see. There, similarly, there was no change in wages. What we did see is repatriation zoomed uh, in 2018, uh, and they were uh, followed by, um, and they remained high in 2019, and they were accompanied in both years, particularly in 2018, with a large, uh, unprecedented uh, repurchase of shares by corporations. So uh, if there were dramatic real effects, we have yet to see them. The tax change, that the corporate tax change that's being discussed now is much smaller. It's half the rate change, going the opposite direction, but half the rate change. Doesn't have a lot of the base broadening uh, provisions uh, like uh, expensing of equipment. So my conclusion would be that if we didn't see anything for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was even noticeable, then why would we expect much of anything here? Now, I will also say that, uh, just to add that the only thing that this tax uh, change in 2017 did was to reduce revenues and enrich shareholders is what it looks like. Um, I'm not, not surprised by this, actually. I've never thought that there would be a big effect from these changes. First of all, because if real investment's driven by the cost of capital, then the changes in the cost of capital were much smaller than these, these statutory rate changes. Uh, and also, um, uh, and, and uh, it was uh, Harry Grubert and John Muti many years ago made this point and I keep making it and nobody else pays attention to it but me, I think, is which is debt is subsidized by high corporate tax rate. And therefore when you 
reduce the corporate tax rate, reduce that debt subsidy. And if debt is very mobile internationally compared to equity, then you can actually get a lower tax rate reducing the, inf the aggregate inflow of capital. So just quickly, I think I'm running out of time, but um, I would say guilty uh, should uh, by uh, limiting the, disallowing the tangible uh, deduction and imposing a per country foreign tax credit should attract tangible capital back to the United States. I, I don't, don't agree with Jay's views on, uh, or possibly Mahir's views on that. Uh, but I think it would be small. And I think the rest of the proposals are really about profit shifting and gaining revenues uh, through limiting that, uh, which actually, to the extent a standalone policy reduces the debt, that'll actually be beneficial for investment. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll move on to me here. Thanks uh, very much. And thanks, Thornton and Eric, for inviting me to be on this panel with Jay and Jane. Uh, I've, I too have benefited enormously from TPC activities and publications for many years, so I'm thankful for that. So, you know, overall, I would characterize the Biden proposals as a pretty significant missed opportunity to rethink business taxation. And I think that's disappointing, and I'll try to lay out why that is. You know, the first reason for that is it continues the preoccupation with C corporations that we've seen over the last decade or two and completely neglects the rise of pass-through income and business income earned through pass-through form. And of course, uh, the issues that were associated with 199 Cap A. So we are continuing in this tradition of uh, emphasizing and penalizing and demonizing C corporations while the reality of business income in the United States is pass-throughs and we refuse to confront that because of the rhetoric of small businesses that they wrap themselves in. And I think that's uh, really unfortunate. You know, similarly, the uh, emphasis and uh, exclusive emphasis on C corporations uh, is unfortunate because it's wrapped in some notion of fairness and equity, which we've heard earlier this morning. And we seem to kind of continue to perpetrate the fiction that um, the corporate tax is borne exclusively by shareholders when we know, in fact, Estimates based on work by Clemens Foist or Owen Zedar suggest that um, half of uh, the burden of the corporate tax is borne by labor. So uh, we are continuing an emphasis on an instrument which is uh, not terribly well oriented towards fairness, yet we wrap our rhetoric about it in fairness. And that seems uh, very problematic. Second, in addition to emphasizing the corporate form, we, the Biden proposals emphasize and continue this uh, tradition of demonizing the international operations of multinational firms. And that seems highly problematic too, in part because it buys into two fictions. The first fiction being that firms ship jobs overseas and uh, that there is a real risk of that. And in some sense, we should be worried about that. That I think feeds protectionist sentiment more than it's attached to economic reality. As Jay mentioned, uh, there's evidence of complementarity between foreign and domestic, and there's very little to no evidence of substitutability of uh, foreign and domestic activities. So that fiction is being continued with heavier and heavier emphasis on uh, the overseas activities of multinational firms. And of course, it, it buys into this logic that people have propagated that transfer pricing is uh, this remarkably huge problem where there are hundreds of billions of dollars uh, stored in tax havens by US corporations. Uh, that I think those estimates have been discredited. I think most people think they're seriously inflated. And in fact, um, we are fighting the last battle. That was the battle of the pre-TCGA world where in fact, corporations did remarkably stupid and unfortunate things because of the advantages of deferral. That is the battle pre-TCJ, that is not the battle today. So we've bought into the world of uh, only going after the corporate form. We've bought into the idea of demonizing the international operations of multinational firms. And then finally, we have bought into seemingly this endless appetite for complexity, which is fine tuning in an even greater and greater degree um, the ways we tax corporations and specifically international operations, which is, I think, precisely mislearning the lessons of TCJA, which, instru which instituted a number of very novel, very complex instruments, which did very little. And we know from that kind of complexity that actually taxpayers win. Uh, it's not uh, the government that wins. And then finally, uh, the Biden proposals have hitched themselves to uh, greater international coordination. 
and the idea of a foreign minimum tax. And I think that's problematic for several reasons. First, it's not clear that it will happen. Um, second, it's not clear that it will happen. We already see the UK backtracking on it. We'll see what happens as it goes to the G20. It will take literally years and years to negotiate based just on the EU's experience within the EU to figure out what a tax base would be. Uh, and of course, we know that the revenue from such estimates are actually fairly trivial coming out of the UK. And in fact, there's estimates of lost revenue. So it is, again, in part and parcel of the sentiment that runs through these proposals, which is populist and protectionist. And unfortunately, I don't think necessarily terribly good policy. And ultimately, I think it stems from what I think is the original sin of Biden tax policy, which is the promise not to raise taxes on people below 400,000, which is something that ends up resulting in curious measures <laughs> like an emphasis on the corporate tax as a way to address equity issues. Um, when we tell 98 plus percent, 98 to 0.5% of Americans that they will not get a tax increase, we're, we're, we're beginning the policy of tax policy and tax reform in the wrong way. Great. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, so I have some follow up questions. Um, a couple of in this uh, first question also relates to a question posed by Stephen Shea uh, at Harvard. Um, a couple of you mentioned that um, despite a very large literature telling us that uh, investment should be sensitive to um, corporate tax rates and, and the uh, cost of capital. Um, our most recent experience of a very large tax change, which uh, TCJA cut the headline rate um, 14 points. It also uh, gave us 100% bonus depreciation while enacting some uh, moderate restrictions on interest deductibility. Uh, we didn't see um, a significant uh, change in investment there. And I was wondering if um, well, Jane mentioned that, that uh, the net effect on the co cost of capital was not as large. Um, uh, however, other explanations have been given such as, um, you know, well, uh, with the bonus depreciation, uh, our corporate tax is now, uh, effectively a rent tax um, or even less than a rent tax because we still have the interest deductibility. Um, uh, other explanations that have been uh, given relate to oligopolization, uh, you know, the increasing share of rents uh, in, in corporate earnings. Um, and of course, uh, um, uh, we would expect a rent tax to have less, of a, less behavioral effects, if, uh, if any. Um, or is it, is it also, could it potentially also be a timing uh, issue? The fact that TCJ was introduced um, pretty late in the business cycle, the American economy had already been expanding for the better part of a decade. Um, uh, so maybe there just wasn't that much upside uh, on investment. Um, could some of the panelists um, comment on that? Well, I, I, so just a, just a minor kind of picky thing. My impression is that investment did go up following the TCJA, but people don't think it's due to the tax price changes in the TCJA. I mean, there's, there's that IMF paper that used, I, I think it's some kind of an, like an accelerator model and said, oh, it's mostly due to demand. And then Jane's stuff, which you know, I've done same thing and, and uh, suggest that the increases in investment didn't really match the changes in, in the cost of capital, but it did go up. But in addition to what you said, or maybe I missed it, and I apologize if I did, interest rates are very low. And so tax and, and, and corporations are right now flush and have been flush with money. So I don't know that the hurdle rates of return that they're facing are very, were very high to begin with. And so these tax changes may have had, I think that this may be related to or maybe exactly what Jane meant that the tax changes aren't gonna have that big an effect because the hurdle rates of return already are, are so low. I would... I, yeah, I, excuse me, here, go ahead. No, no, please, go ahead. I just wanna say, I mean, the, the uh, this cost of capital issue, I think is very important. People get this notion that we cut, we had deep cuts in the corporate tax rate and that that somehow affected the cost of capital, but it doesn't for intangible assets that are expensed at the margin, there's no effect on the cost of capital. And also for those assets, if you borrow to finance those assets, 
because we still deduct nominal interest, uh, we deduct the inflation portion of interest, we de deduct it in full instead of having an incentive. So you have a system that begins with very low effective tax rates. And then you add those, those to the fact that taxes are just a piece of the cost of capital in the first place because depreciation is important and you just get small percentage changes. So I just, you know, I, it, like I said, it didn't surprise me. Uh, I think the other issue is <clears throat> we don't really know how uh, responsive international capital flows are. We've, there have been studies in the past. They're certainly not infinite elasticities. I think they tend to run around three, but the, those empirical studies are very limited in what they've looked at. They've mostly looked at multinational corporations and direct investment, and there's a whole lot of investment that goes on in the world that's outside of direct investment of multinational corporations. So there's, there's borrowing from abroad and so forth. So, but I've just always um, wondered if we really have a good handle on how mobile international capital is. And that was the linchpin on which the whole idea of this corporate tax cut, you know, encouraging capital investment and benefiting labor and all the things that were claimed for it at the time really depends on those relationships. I, I'd like to see more investigation of those relationships. I, I was just gonna underscore Jane, what you said earlier, which is, it, you know, people focus though on the statutory rate change, but from a user cost perspective, there was really little change. And, and that's because of the reasons you mentioned. I'll just mention one more, you know, obviously the rate change and expensing uh, would reduce uh, the user cost. Um, although, you know, given sh relatively short equipment lives over the last two decades, the shortening of equipment lives and the interest rate environment, it would be relatively small. You pointed out on interest, uh, you, you pointed out the deductibility of interest, which was limited and had a lower rate associated with it. And of course, there were limitations on losses. So all of that adds up uh, in a user cost framework to a more muted effect. So I think important people looking towards oligopolization or other rents kinds of questions often look there, but I think the answer is actually simpler and it's exactly what Jane got us started on. Great. Um, looking at a bigger picture uh, for the moment, um, uh, most of the business tax changes were part of the American Jobs Plan, which is um, geared towards raising revenue for infrastructure investment, uh, which uh, Jay mentioned in his opening remarks. Um, each of you has been critical in various ways of, of the uh, reforms put forward. So uh, maybe we could just go around the virtual table uh, and you could comment briefly on, um, you know, what would have been the best way, uh, in your opinion, um, uh, to raise this type of revenue? And um, certainly uh, changes to the corporate income tax, uh, inclusive um, base broadening uh, versus rate increases. Uh, and also think in terms of business versus individual taxation, or me here, as you, as you mentioned, uh, pass-through taxation. Um, uh, or even including other types of taxes, such as uh, consumption taxes, excise taxes, or user fees. I think there's a, I mean, I, I think there's a substantial case to be made for switching, moving strongly towards consumption taxes that are clearly consumption taxes, not income taxes that are just masquerading as, as consumption taxes. I, I think, I think that there, I. My guess is that that's the wave of the future, given uh, the fiscal position of the federal government, and uh, and I think we could go there. I think it would be helpful to go there now. I recall that David Brad. My memory is that towards the end of his life, David Bradford, who was a strong advocate of consumption taxes, switched the basis, or, or at least the emphasis, the weights on the basis of his advocacy for those taxes away from the potential increases in investment and because of the reduction in the taxation of normal return and towards simplicity. And consumption taxes can be so much simpler than income taxes because income is just really hard to measure. And uh, consumption is much less hard to measure. And I think that my own opinion is that the US tax system would be improved by switching in an important way to consumption taxes. With respect to corporate taxes in particular, there's Alan Auerbach's proposal to go to what's essentially cash flow tax, which is like a consumption tax, but only on capital income that received a lot of play both in, 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 the, in the academy and in the, in, it even made its way in one way or another into the political process. 
and ended up being rejected. But you know, I think I think that still has a fair amount to uh, to support it. And if you're going to stick with some kind of a something like a corporate tax, a number of Harry and and Roseanne and uh, Eric and Alan Viard had talked about significantly cutting the corporation income tax, maybe doing something with interest taxes and then shifting a lot of, to the extent you have to shift the burden back on to resident US shareholders because they can't move around so much. And so you're more likely to uh, be able to collect the revenue from them. I think those are all ways that are superior to trying to more or less double down on a tax system that has just, that has not worked very well for a long time and uh, and constantly is trying to be shorn up in ways that never really seem to work. I, I, I would, uh, yeah, I mean, I think in general, I would uh, subscribe to Jay's ideas about moving towards consumption tax, but to be, a, you know, obviously that's a big uh, stretch in many ways, you know, but a couple of other thoughts about how to fund the infrastructure plan ra relative to what they're doing, you know, so first, the most obvious irony is that a carbon tax is not a piece of this picture, and it, from my taste, would clearly be a piece of the picture, and it would be an important piece of the picture, and it's disappointing that it's not a piece of the picture. I think it would have been wise to raise the corporate rate, uh, perhaps 24, 25%, I think makes sense, uh, without, and that is a fair amount of revenue, without uh, necessarily all the other international provisions, maybe repealing expensing. Um, and then one would think about things on the capital gain side and, you know, not the stuff they're going after, which is interesting, but, you know, I think carryover basis at death would make a ton of sense. I think uh, a lot of the stuff, the fact that we have a zero rate on capital gains for people up to $100,000 of capital gains is remarkable opportunity zones, small business stocks. There's a lot of stuff to do uh, that I don't necessarily think make a ton of sense, which would have been in addition to progressivity uh, at the individual side. So I think there's lots of places to go uh, to fund things. Um, obviously, a consumption tax is a fantastic version of it, but a, a carbon tax would have been obvious. And then there are the other things that I uh, that I mentioned. Well, um, I guess you know I don't have any personal views on what we should do, but I think if you look at it through the lens of the first question is how important is, is progressivity or distribution? I know that's, if to the extent that's an, an important social objective right now, then you, you want a tax that's gonna fall on higher income people, which makes the corporate tax a possible tax. It also makes the cash flow tax, except that just falls on high income old people. So I have might have a, 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 a minor personal interest in that. Uh, but those, the, so things like carbon taxes or things like general consumption taxes are not going to fall on high income people mostly. So if distribution is important, that's going to, unless you can have some kind of rebate or, or support, you know, and that would be complicating things. Uh, I mean, the second issue is efficiency and, uh, you know, the, the, the differential taxes do create inefficiencies. I've never thought the, uh, the tax on capital in general has much of an efficient efficiency effect because it's much evidence that savings responds to any of that. And right now we have very close rates between corporate and and uh, non corporate uh, composite investments. So you might want to keep your eye on that as you make changes, not only in corporations, but maybe in, in pass through businesses. Um, I do think one thing that sort of meets the efficiency test is the guilty reforms. Because I have, I, I think it just seems very clear that the efficient way to operate around the world is to impose the same tax wherever you are. And I think the guilty changes move things in that direction. Of course, I've had that view for a long time and never, never even with Mahir's attempts, never run into anything to make me change my mind about that. So uh, I think internet, the international reforms, I think, are very good from an efficiency a standpoint with respect to the international allocation of capital. I will say the cash flow tax uh, was had a lot of attractive uh, uh, possibilities, but I just it became hopeless. I mean, I wrote things trying to explain that the, the exchange rates were going to adjust this import act, you know, imposition on imports and, and exclusion exports. And it just got nowhere. People just did not believe it. And they were so afraid that they would have some disastrous price increase on in their imported products. And that's what I think killed that cash flow tax. And, and, you know, you do have to operate in a political environment and you have to think about what, what's possible. And so I think that puts 
the cash flow tax is as attractive as it is in many ways kind of off the table. And with respect to consumption or uh, carbon taxes, I certainly agree that they're a very attractive source of revenue if you actually collect revenue from them. I mean, one of the issues with them is that there are all these proposals to give it all back or give huge fractions of it back. And then there's also a slight issue about revenue stability because to the extent it has its desired effect, if you don't change the rate per ton of carbon released, you're gonna yield less and less revenue over time, which is what's intended as a, for an externality point of view, but it does interfere with having it be a stable source of revenue. Yeah, I would echo uh, uh, another failure we've made to communicate to politicians is that a carbon tax does not need to rebate the revenues back to the companies because it's passed on and prices to the consumers. And you could use some of those revenues maybe to provide relief for low income people. But again, there's some, some points that just seem very difficult to get across. So. You might wanna provide relief to low income people just to pr just provide relief for low income people. I mean, it, it, I mean it, 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 carbon taxes or whatever, I mean, if they're deserving of relief, which they are, then, then just do it. And, and we've done, so Ernst & Young has done, and many other people have done similar things that suggest that a lot, depend, these rebate schemes can just kill even the, the advantages of even going to a carbon tax. And the, the economic benefits of it are much higher, depend, or very, very dramatically, depending on what's done with the money. The Biden proposals did, of course, uh, include numerous measures um, in the energy tax field, mostly uh, eliminating existing incentives for the fossil fuel industry uh, and um, providing various tax credits for alternative um, uh, um, renewable energy. Um, could any of you care to comment on you know, the relative efficacy of a carbon tax um, versus those types of measures? Well, the, I don't know that much about the credits for renewable energy in the proposal. I just haven't looked closely at those. But the incentives that uh, for oil and gas are pretty small now. I mean, you could get rid of them, but they're pretty small because most of the majors, they don't have percentage depletion anymore. Uh, they have limits on how much they can deduct an intangible drilling cost. So, but yeah, I mean, it makes some sense if you're moving towards a cleaner energy to get rid of them, but I don't think they're going to have a big effect on, uh, you know, on the, as the carbon tax might. So I'd say relative to the carbon tax, it's pretty small potatoes. But as I say, I don't know much about what kind of incentives for renewable energy we have. Um, those, those can be important. I know the ones, I believe the ones for wind are, are sort of crucial to that industry continuing out the ones that we already have, so. I mean, as a, as a general matter, uh, I prefer carbon taxes, although I'm certainly in favor of uh, removing the subsidies that we currently have in place. So that, that is certainly a good part to do. To the degree that we are comparing carbon taxes with credits, uh, the first thing to say is I think credits have been, I think in some sense, quite successful in the renewable space in, in creating scale economies and getting down the learning curve, which is what we would hope them to do, and changing the unit economics in a very significant way. And I think that's been helpful. I think my general hesitation about credits is like with credits that we seem to be infatuated with throughout the tax code, you know, which is we, we, we just have become so infatuated with them because of tax expenditures. And because there's like this weird uh, alliance between the investors and the credits and the people who want to achieve these things. And it's just a weird political uh, dynamic there, which makes them more attractive. You know, having said that, I think there's a fair amount of leakage associated with them. And I think uh, a carbon tax well-structured would have been a, a first order great thing to do. Great. Um, we've had uh, some questions from the audience relating to the incidence of the corporate income tax. Um, and um, uh, Jay has commented that, you know, traditionally the corporate income tax is seen as, you know, highly distortionary. Um, it also um, uh, often, uh, I think there's a common conception that, you know, uh, corporations pay taxes in their own right, or they, they fall entirely on existing shareholders who tend to be wealthier. Um, uh, both the Treasury's model and the TPC model, however, have uh, at least a piece of the long run incidents falling on, um, uh, on labor uh, and through a, a reduced uh, in investment effect. Um, 
could, could any of you comment on the incidence of the current uh, corporate income tax being structured, um, you know, uh, uh, more or less as a rent tax? Well, I'm, I'm happy to, I've written a lot on this. So I think that uh, first of all, as you may know, a lot of, a lot of uh, econometric studies came out in advance of the 2017 uh, tax cut that seemed to show that most of the tax falls on capital. It turns out those studies were flawed or they produced uh, unreasonable results. I, I believe one study, you know, found that every dollar of corporate tax would you know, reduce labor by $22. And that's certainly not within the framework of anything that's believable. So we have models that can tell you sort of how constrained they are. And those, most of those models, uh, and there's a CBO uh, working paper that, and it's also published in the National Tax Journal. I'll just mention it since my daughter wrote it, um, that sort of reviewed all of the models and basically concluded that, you know, somewhere between 16, 80% of the burden falls on capital in those models. Now those models don't allow for rent. So if you add rent to the mix, you're gonna have a little more of it fall on capital because the rents, uh, to the extent that you, you have any permanent rents, and I'm not sure you really can, but you can have them for a period of time, those would fall on stockholders. Uh, and, um, and then, um, uh, so, I think the bottom line is that most of the burden of the corporate tax falls on capital income of one kind or another, and probably very little of it uh, falls on labor. Yeah, so I, I, I take the alternative view, uh, Jane, which is, uh, and in particular, if you're looking for sources, uh, in my Musgrave lecture, I referenced the work of Owen Zedar and um, Clemens Foist, both in peer reviewed journals in the last couple of years have put the number closer at 50% for labor. Um, and additional work, which also talks about shifting to consumers. These are empirical estimates, not models, because we know from models, you can get all kinds of things um, that um, product prices bear some of that and their product prices that are most likely to impact uh, lower income folks. So I think that is why uh, we have to think hard about why and how when policymakers, you know, Jane was saying, we, we've done a bad job educating people on various issues. And this is one of them, right, which is we, people, including people earlier today, continue with the fiction that corporations have to pay their fair share and use that language. And it's, it's just problematic uh, language because we're perpetrating the fiction that corporations are nothing, you know, that in fact, this is gonna be borne by somebody, capital, labor, consumers. Um, and that I think is what this debate gets wrong uh, and gets wrong all the time. Well, let me just, I just want to say something about Owen Zedar's paper. He's a very capable economist, but his paper was about state, uh, across state studies, and capital is probably much more mobile across states than it is uh, internationally. International now has to be the source of any of the burden falling on labor, because in the old closed economy models, uh, you know, it all fall, fell on capital with any kind of reasonable set of, of assumptions about product substitutability and so forth. Uh, in an open economy, it's going to de depend on the uh, uh, capital flows. But as I've said earlier, you can have a crease in the corporate tax rate the way it's set up right now can have an effect on debt capital, on debt finance capital. And therefore, you can get the opposite results. You can get an increase in the corporate tax, uh, not decreasing wages, but increasing wages. So if you take the standard constraints of international capital flows, imperfect portfolio substitution, imperfect product substitution, multi-sector models where some goods are not tradable, multi-sector models where some goods are not subject to tax because in the non-corporate sector, uh, and add rents, add debt, then I think you just don't have a case for much of the tax falling on labor, uh, regardless yeah, of what the, the study said. And I think, I think Owen is, you know, his study was, was done very well. I mean, it re really did try to control for a lot of things, but it is, is not an international study. Well, but I think that's exactly it, Jane. With models, we know on incidents that the result is indeterminate for all the reasons you just said. And so empirical evidence is where one would want to look. Uh, and, and it's complicated to look at state level uh, changes, although that's what we do in often many cases to try to figure out things generally. And that's what he did and what Clemens has done and others have done. So I had a couple things to add. One is, which is kind of following up on what Jane said, 
is that the like even the efficiency effects, the investment incentive effects of changes in the corporation income tax rate can depend on what you think the marginal source of finance is. If you go back to like a Stiglitz world where it's debt, then you can get counterintuitive counterintuitive effects because the current tax system can subsidize debt finance because of rate differentials in the presence of inflation. And then the other, another point I, on, uh, with respect to the distribution of the corporate tax, the corporate tax, you know, like it or not, it's gonna be pretty progressive whether it's shifted to labor or not because wages tend to be accrued disproportionately pretty high up in the income tax stream. So even if you assume that a fair amount of the corporation income tax is shifted onto labor, you're still going to get, a, it's still going to be a pretty, pretty progressive tax. I mean, my own view is that a fair amount of it is shifted onto labor. And I think it's fair to say it's somewhere, you know, I mean, maybe up to 50% or something. I mean, that's, uh, I think there's a lot of support for that. Thank you. Oh, uh, I, should, I think you should read my paper that reviewed all the econometric studies. And no, I, I, have, about I, that. I have. I have. I, 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 I agree with much of what's in your paper, Jan. Thank you. A uh, quick correction came through the feed. I said Steve Shea was at Harvard. He is at Boston College Law School. So um, uh, I wanted to talk briefly about the uh, guilty reform, um, where we saw a lot of questions um, uh, also during. Um, uh, Jared's uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> how do you think the, the reform uh, as proposed, and I already sort of outlined the major features, um, would affect multinational corporations, um, both their, uh, their investment uh, at home and abroad, um, uh, but also um, profit shifting and overall revenue liabilities? Well, I'll sort of plunge in here. Again, I, as I said, I don't think we have, we have some evidence that there's substitutability and we have then some studies showing complementarity um, among, um, uh, between foreign and, and direct domestic investment. I don't think worrying about multinational corporations with respect to their investment is the story. The story ought to be worrying about total domestic investment and therefore, uh, anything that encourages more investment abroad has got to reduce the amount of investment in the aggregate in the United States. And so I think that's the first thing, uh, because if you have a fixed capital and a fixed labor supply, you have these six resources in the United States, you can't be complementary with everything. You can only be complementary with some things. And even if all the multinationals grew because uh, there were benefits or contracted because there were increases, uh, you can't have that happen in the total domestic economy. I think the issue of profit shifting uh, is a very important one for uh, revenue purposes because we have, you know, we have a lot of revenue that's going untaxed that that's, we should be taxing and that could contribute to our, you know, to our need for revenue. Uh, and as I said earlier, I think the, I think that probably it will reduce will probably not have very much effect on tangible capital because I just don't think tangible capital is very substitutable in most cases. Jay or me here? Well, I guess, um, you know, first, I think the worldview that I think Jane just espoused, which is that, you know, investment outside of the United States inevitably crowds out investment domestically is belied by two or three decades of global growth and large amounts of investment around the world that have inured to the benefit of US companies and US employees and US shareholders. And that I think is the world we live in. And it's not altogether surprising for anybody who works in a private sector firm to know that when that firm succeeds globally, they succeed domestically. I don't think that's a terrible jump to make. On Guilty in particular, um, you know, it is addressing this uh, notion out there that there are hundreds of billions of dollars in tax revenue. I, I think that reflects what the pre-TCJA world looked like, which was a very perverse world where um, you had incentives to defer taxation by storing cash overseas. And it was a perverse world and, and we're past that world. And so what will this do? It will inevitably you know, increase the tax on foreign uh, operations. It will result in a lot of complexity that will be gamed by corporations to their benefit. It will, uh, in combination with the rate change, continue to allow for incentives uh, 
to expatriate via the merger market to continue to percolate, not explicitly invert, but get bought over by other companies. So we'll perhaps go back to the whack-a-mole game we were playing before, where companies, US companies were bought out by foreign companies. Um, a, a path that does not uh, reward American welfare in any, in any way. So it, it taken together, um, it's a lot of complexity for the promise, and I think it's an illusory promise of some hundreds of billions of dollars of offshore profits that are not of anywhere near that magnitude, where our current guilty regime already uh, addresses many of the problems that we wanted to address with a minimum tax. So taken together, it's, it's a little bit disappointing. Yeah, you mentioned uh, inversions in particular, which were sort of a steady feature of the pre-TCJA world, uh, where we had worldwide with at 35%, but, but with deferral, um, is, uh, and uh, since the reform, um, uh, you know, guilty your tax either immediately or not at all, and if so, at a lower rate and with an exclusion for a 10% return on, on foreign assets, we've got, we've got the global pooling. So um, it seems as though, you know, inversion pressure uh, has gone away under the current regime. Please feel free to contradict me if you, if you see other evidence. Um, but um, would, the, would the proposed reforms then um, uh, bring back that inversion pressure? Uh, so you know, how, how big a deal is, is that really? And then uh, we also have the OECD Pillar 2 reforms, which would try to kind of universalize uh, foreign minimum taxes, uh, at least among the other you know, major capital exporting economies. Um, how would, how would that affect uh, the viability of Biden's reform proposals and the, the competitive, uh, you know, the competitive position of U.S. multinationals? Well, uh, uh, the last I looked, we haven't had a, an inversion of any size, a firm that's big enough to be talked about in the press certainly since the TCJA, but I think that uh, inversions had pretty much dried up after the treasury regulations in 2016. Uh, not that the guilty proposals might not make them more attractive again, but the, I, I presume that's why the administration always ha also has its package uh, tightening of the anti-inversion rules by uh, treating a firm as inverted when with a merger, if, when it owns more than 50% of the company instead of 80%. Uh, and also treating it as a U.S. firm is managed and controlled in the United States. So I think those will make, you know, those changes will, you know, help offset some of the incentive. You don't know how, how it's going to happen until, you know, you see what happens. But uh, these proposals that are in the administration proposal have been around for a long time in Congress. Uh, but I think they just, people just decided inversions we're not such a, uh, you know, such, not such a big deal. It's also, um, um, excuse me, I forgot I had my house phone in my office. Uh, that, uh, and I think I lost thread of what I was about to say here, but um, uh, I think that uh, uh, some of the other provisions uh, might deal better with earnings stripping too, like the, the proposal to allocate interest deductions for a you know for a, a country around around the world in proportion to your share of assets, so you can't load up, uh, say, a higher U.S. tax rate uh, location with debt, and possibly this new uh, base erosion proposal, which will disallow deductions for for uh, payments to tax havens. So. Um, that would also encourage, you know, inversions. So you're going to have to be concerned, I think, about inversions. And then there, there's also future activity. I mean, it may be difficult for existing firms to get out of the U.S., but new firms, new firms could be formed overseas instead of in the U.S. And then there's other ways to get the activity out of the U.S. by contracting with foreign companies. I mean, there's a the, the same sorts of pressures to a large extent that lead towards inversions can push other sorts of distorting behavior, even if, even if you've locked down on inversions per se. Uh, so, can, sorry, can you elaborate on that? Where you could form, so instead of forming a new corporation in the United States, investors could form one out, outside the United States. And so it would start outside the US, 
or U.S. firms could, could have more of their activity. They could contract more things overseas than they would otherwise so that the income shows up overseas and then you only get, I mean, like maybe the normal return comes back to the U.S. I mean, even, even that they might be able to do something with. I mean, that these companies have high price tax advisors and business planners that are very clever and are able to think up stuff that, you know, nobody ever thought of when they were writing the tax book. Um, I wanted to touch briefly on um, uh, two things, uh, leverage and, and rate versus base. Uh, Jane has commented that, you know, um, uh, the effect on uh, debt finance investment usually has the opposite sign uh, uh, in response to rate changes um, than <clears throat> equity finance investment. Um, so uh, has there been any uh, significant effect of TCJA on, on corporate financial structure um, due to that uh, a deleveraging and, and uh, what would you expect to see from uh, the Biden proposals on that score? Well, I, all I can say is the only evidence I know about debt uh, equity substitution dates back to when we did the integration study at Treasury a long time ago, <laughs> yeah, long and it time. was small. But but as to what's happened now, I you know I just I just don't know. I don't know whether it's still relatively unresponsive or not. And then there's also the restrictions on the deductibility of interest that I think interact in ways and. Uh, I think different people have modeled this, have come to different conclusions of quite the way they interact, but it is. They, they we haven't people. seen those debt restrictions take full effect yet because we right. haven't moved uh, to EBIT, uh, so. uh, to a me right. measure of income that does not, right. that's before you deduct depreciation and yep. amortization. I mean, my, my sense of things is that those restrictions, uh, which are an important piece of, again, you know, going back to Jane's initial point about why these are cost, uh, didn't decline as much as people expected. That's an important piece of it. Uh, I think the restrictions bite to some degree in some highly levered private equity transactions, but I think otherwise don't. I think the reality of the corporate world today is that borrowing considerations are uh, entirely driven by you know this remarkably low interest rate environment <laughs> that we are living in and that we continue to perpetrate or perpetuate for reasons that are um, you know interesting. Uh, and so. I think that dominates all kinds of tax effects that you would observe uh, otherwise. Um, well, we're running out of time, but just quickly, um, uh, Biden left the, the most of the CIT base, uh, corporate income tax uh, base, pretty much untouched, but there are um, program changes coming up. Um, uh, this year, R and starting next year, R&D will have to be capitalized. Um, and uh, we have the um, phase out of bonus depreciation starting through 2026, um, the tighter earnings stripping rules next, uh, next year that Jane, uh, that Jane noted. Um, and then in 2026, we also have the expiration of 199 cap A. Um, uh, do, uh, just quickly, um, you know, do, you, do any of you um, care to comment about um, how, um, uh, uh, how policy could best um, address those issues? Should they just be allowed to take place or, or should there be modifications made there? Well, I think what you wanna do with the pass-through deduction depends on what you do with corporate taxes because part of the reason for that was to give them a tax cut when you gave the corporations a tax cut. So if you wanna not have big differentials between the corporate and non-corporate uh, investment, you might wanna pay attention to that. There's also the whole labor income issue that comes in with the pass-through deduction that is, a, is in, in my mind, a potential problem. I mean, why are you giving people who make up to whatever it is, $320,000 in accounting firms or law firms, a lower tax rate than everybody else? I mean, it, I, it just seems like a strange like a strange policy. If you want to target it to capital income, fine, because that's what the distortion is. But having it apply to all sources of income, I, I think is... Uh, I think is a problem. Well, they started off with that idea. I think it was in Camp's bill was to do something like that. I can't remember exactly, but there were proposals, but I think they they were gonna run into the same problem that you have right now of how do you differentiate between capital and labor, except you no, I, spread right. it from subchapter S to all pass-throughs. No, right, I get it. I mean, it's just, it, it just 
just it's hard to measure on tax income right i mean i don't know yeah well, unfortunately as usual just as the conversation is really heating up we have to say goodbye <laughs> so um i wanted to thank um all the panelists from both panels and our keynote speaker jared bernstein and all of our audience members uh, especially those who shared their questions with us um for coming today. And um, if, if you're interested in corporate taxes, TPC has another event coming up in mid-July specifically on the OECD BEPS uh, provisions. So we look forward to seeing you then. <laughs>